Hello, guys. Hello. Hi. Welcome, everybody. Hello. Welcome to the Wolf Den podcast. How are you doing? Hi. Settle down. Sit down. Yeah. Hello. It's Christmas. It's Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in my sweater. I can see that. I forgot to bring a Santa hat. I had one and I didn't bring it. I have one somewhere. Mom and the red and black one? Yeah. Yeah. Mom, it's mom and dad have it. Oh, I don't actually have it then. No. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Got a little CRT. Well, fake CRT. Yes. Over here. I got a little thing. I'm afraid to touch it because okay. the wire's messed up. But I got a little thing that just loops a video. Yes. That's all it does. This yeah. little thing back here that runs off an SD card just yeah, loops yeah, yeah, whatever yeah. video I want. Okay. So we're, that's uh, looping. Yeah, there you go. Anyway, hey, how you how going, you doing? guys? How is everybody? Uh, thank you to Epic Chicken for the Prime subscription. Big deal for the Prime. And Teardrop Tone for the 13 months. And LJWVU for five whole gifted subs. Oh, thank you, everybody. And a webs for the 16 months how you doing guys hey uh there's a lot of things to talk about today yes i'm surprised because it's like i said it's the end of the year it's christmas time i didn't think i didn't think anything was going on yeah usually people take a break (laughs) i know oh hi hi wood hey Wood's in the chat hey girl uh we just got this i forgot about the table yes we got a whole new podcast we do table. it's a, we got a fancy like a, a professional podcast uh, i know table. thank you thrill house he yeah. also made me a very nice arcade cabinet yes but he also made wood the same exact table oh yeah i see so that way we have the same table when we do the nintendo so it's like split down the got middle. It. so this, is, this was like a wolf den podcast table uh-huh. that ended up being co-opted by the nintendo podcast i i of. sense a theme with that podcast generally <laughs> oh a theme of what will <laughs> oh nothing you think you think you think it's stealing your vibe <laughs> i i don't think and i didn't say that i don't think i know it does <laughs> uh, mine shattered on the way home into pieces i will fucking kill you wood if that happened Woods, you know what shattered into a million pieces? His Woods, stomach. Woods butthole. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what yeah. happened. I don't know. I guess it you know. can't be the Moe's, and here's why. Because we all ate it. Because we all ate it, and also, I had, it, I had the leftovers two days ago. <laughs> yeah. He said he was sick, and I was like, let's put this to the test, yeah. and I ate the leftovers, the leftover ground beef. Yeah. And it was good. Yeah. And I have more in the fridge. Okay. I'm gonna have I, more later. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I've. You know, it's Tuesday, so I make tacos at the house, and I really think I should reconsider that because I've been farting up a storm. All right, and well, it's not good for this show. I mean, so. I'll tolerate it. I think I, you know we have a good distance between us. We do. Yeah. I just don't want you know to be talking and then there's silence and all of a sudden you hear me. Oh, you don't want an audible? Yeah. Fart. Okay. You, you guys and girls don't need that in your life. No. Uh, yeah. I, I'll, I'll live with being called in the crossfire yeah i mean we grew up with it so it's true <laughs> grew up with farting yeah uh lady bug thanks for the gifted sub and luke antone thanks for the 36 months and razzle jazzle thanks for the gifted sub guys we're doing the giveaway thing again i don't yes. know if i put it in the tie in the title i did uh it's all set up you can do it uh, if you do exclamation point giveaway it should work now uh anyway will what are the things we got list off the things we're talking about uh what are the things we're talking about well um there's a whole lot of lawsuits happening right there are mostly in europe involving nintendo but also one in america that your europe seems to be like fighting for our rights as consumers (laughs) well we seem to be doing a bad job i think the thing is europe in general is much more hands-on when it comes to like regulating companies especially like big tech companies consumer protection yes they're they're much more european governments are much more hands-on okay with that in this country that doesn't really happen unless uh somebody gets killed okay or true they think it could possibly you know conflict with conservative christian values and the children might become satanists or enough people get hurt where there will be a class action lawsuit yes but but that's, even that's more of the company coming to terms with itself. even then it's a lot more like the company will say all right we'll take care of it leave us alone and they'll yeah. let them the uh, famous example video game rating system the whole reason why we have video game rating systems because all the game companies in the 90s said please we'll take care of it just leave us alone and they did they created the ESRB, which 
you know, say what you will about it. It is consistently considered the best writing system in all of entertainment. Why? Because it is the most accurate and detailed. Okay. It is very detailed. Yes. Oh, but also, games are like, you know, 20 hours, sometimes yeah. hundreds of hours. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of nooks and crannies. Right. And there's a lot of things that could be hidden there that could... Uh, yeah, you know. and it, it's very thorough. You compare it to like movies and stuff, you know... What is like how many F words are allowed in PG 13 movies now compared um, to like, you know, 10, 15 years ago? You hear it all the time. Whereas, you know, used to be that would just get you an R. Now, they're like the lines are blurred between movie ratings. With video game ratings, it's very clear. Do you we'll think you what? Mortal Kombat would still be rated M? What do you mean? Today? It, yeah, it still is rated M. No, I mean like the Genesis version. Oh, yeah. Probably because there's a lot of like mangled limbs and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I know I did read somewhere because when they were when they were doing the Halo remaster because Halo was originally rated M and when they remastered it, it was also still rated M and they said generally they unless there's something drastically different between the two versions they, they won't change it. They yeah Halo it. is probably the least deserving of an M rating. Yeah. Is yeah. there a is there blood in that game? There is eventually Halo starting with Halo 5 they started to be rating T. Okay. Because I mean yeah it, it makes compared to like a lot of the other games out there. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Well, uh, this time around... Uh... Oh, wait. Before we get into that, though, there's new games. We yes. We talk about the new games. Yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have Switch Online plus the expansion pack, we got some... Uh, speaking of the 16-bit era, we got some Sega Genesis games coming your way. Oh. Four of them. Shit. Yeah. Um, real simple lineup. We got Golden Axe 2, uh, Alien Storm columns and the genesis version of virtual fighter 2 okay uh golden Axe. well we had golden Axe one right i believe so yeah. uh no. alien storm 2 i don't know anything about alien storm uh I, alien storm is one of those games i always hear of and then when i actually see it i'm like what the fuck is this game <laughs> i do not remember this game yeah i don't this is this looks like turtles in time but, but you're a robot and yeah. april o'neill <laughs> That's very confusing. Okay, Columns, yeah, columns. is just freaking uh, uh, Poyo Poyo. Yeah, Bejeweled or a Match 3 game. I mean, those games are fun. Um, now you have it, uh, the Genesis version of it. This was their answer to Tetris. Um, you can see they did not really win that <laughs> that battle. And Virtua Fighter 2. The worst version of Virtua Fighter 2. The Genesis version. I liked this game. I don't understand how. Like I, I, We had this and we I did. liked it. We did and we played it, but like... You moved like you were on the moon the entire I, time. I kind of like that for some reason. Why? I think I just like the ninja guy. Oh, yeah. It was a ninja guy, and I liked it. Yeah. But I I, I played that game a lot. I yeah. had a lot of fun with it. I don't know why. But not the best version of Virtual Fighter 2, but surprisingly, the one that gets ported the most. Someone in the chat said, RGT already covered this. Okay, I guess we should just close the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> Stop the thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for chatting with us. As always, the Wolf Den Podcast is behind RGT, <laughs> so we can go fuck ourselves. Only one guy is allowed to talk yeah. about one thing at a time in the gaming space. Yeah, seriously. Because that guy watched RGT. Now we can't <laughs> do this anymore. Uh, anyway, we're we're here to talk about an uh, 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 what is this a UK uh, f firm a U a UK group yeah consumer group I guess that fights for consumer protection yeah uh, uh, decided that Joy-Con drift is due to a design flaw in the Joy-Con. Let's go to the Eurogamer article, which is kind of I mean we all know that already. Yeah, it, it it's more of uh like a blatant oversight yeah the des the design flaw is due to oversight it's, yes. it's not like they were like purposely maliciously like designing this thing to be cheaper yeah so that it breaks more it's more so that they didn't realize that grinding it right. away was gonna have this effect over time uh a major new study from the uk gamer gr uk consumer group which that's its question mark. Yeah, which <laughs> which question mark? has found evidence that Nintendo Switch's infamous Joy-Con drift is likely caused by a, a mechanical fault, but pointing to fundamental design flaws. The research found that the Joy-Con's plastic circuit boards showed noticeable wear on the joystick slider contact points, despite only being used for months. 
It is this wear that ultimately results in drifting. In addition, dust and other contaminants were found in the Switch's internal components, despite attempts by Nintendo at dustproofing said areas. Which also criticized Nintendo's handling of the situation and its response to the affected consumers. The organization has called upon Nintendo to provide a compensation or refund plan for any UK consumers who can prove they purchased and an, sorry, who proved they who can prove that they purchased a replacement Joy-Con due to drift since 2017 and said that this scheme uh, should be widely promoted. It is also it has also called for Nintendo to offer a no quibble repair or replacement of all Joy Cons that have been that have developed drift since 2017 completely free of charge. Ooh. In response to this study, Nintendo issued the following statement: The percentage of Joy Con controllers that have been reported as experiencing issues with the analog stick in the in the part in the past is small, and we have been making continuous improvements to the Joy Con analog stick since its launch in 2017. We expect all our hardware to perform as designed. And if anything falls short of this goal, we always encourage consumers to contact Nintendo customer support, who will be happy to openly and leniently resolve any consumer issues related to the Joy-Con controllers, um, including in cases where the warranty may no longer apply. Okay. Uh, have they admitted to making improvements on the Joy-Cons? As far as I know, they've been mum on it. Yeah, I, we... we there was kind of some uh, we, people kind of figured out that they've been making improvements on the Joy Cons. Yeah. They've been different, um, or or but the, the differences have been very very yeah. Minor. That's the thing. Like whatever upgrades they've have, yeah. Like there's no significant difference between a launch Joy Con and like a current Joy Con. Yeah, I remember. I think uh, we discovered that the Animal Crossing Joy Con had like a sticker on the inside yeah. or something, and then I compared it to a launch one, and it had the same thing. Yeah. So. Uh, that or no, it was it was the Zelda Joy-Con versus I think the Animal Crossing one. Yeah. Uh, so they're make we knew that there were there was variations. We didn't know how much of an improvement it was, and I don't yeah. think Nintendo ever actually straight up said that they were making improvements. Probably because the any improvements that they're making are like very minor. But it, also, if they admit to making the changes, then they're admitting to fault and they're yes. being sued over this. That's stuff. I think the biggest problem yeah. here. Now, to Nintendo's credit, they will fix your Joy-Con drift completely free. Yeah. You just send the Joy-Con to Nintendo and they will take care of it. But other than that, their response to this has been disappointingly quiet. Yeah. You know, you think about when the Red Ring of Death happened. And yeah, it took them a while, but eventually Microsoft said, yes, this is a thing. We will replace your Xbox. Yeah. Please don't hate us anymore. And they did. So they replaced the Joy-Con no matter when you got them, right? Correct. So there already is no warranty for Joy-Con. Drift. Basically, just send it in and they'll fix it. Okay, so I mean, the 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 which question mark <laughs> uh, doesn't really. I mean, it seems like Nintendo's falling in line already. They already are are fixing the issue. They're fixing according the issue. to to witches wishes. Well. Which also reported um, that two in five Joy-Con controllers from Nintendo from Nintendo experienced drift. That's okay. still very high that is for high. a system that is like what now six seven years old. Yeah, you would think by this point they would have, you know, lowered that to like one in ten, if anything. But we're still experiencing a significantly high number of Joy-Con drift. Yeah, in this day and age. Uh, somebody in the chat uh, said, oh, Su- Sui Kagura says, are third-party Joy-Cons any better? Um, no. I don't know of any that have hall sensing sticks. Uh, the problem with third-party Joy-Cons is that they're all cheaply made. Yeah. And, and the quality of the Nintendo Joy-Con is still better than any third-party that you can get. Yeah. Um, it It's just unfortunate that it could be susceptible to drift and they yeah. said up to a month after purchasing it or as quickly as a month yeah um, i that's a that you'd have to be playing a lot of smash Brothers lot in order of for that to happen because like it took me like what two years to get drift i still have never gotten it right well but you I, primarily don't play with joy cons yeah i never use joy con uh gully kid is supposedly working on hole sensing joy con sticks but no word on when they'll be ready i haven't heard that yeah uh i talked to them yeah, uh, with the implication of wanting to put one of their hall sensing things into a 
Joy-Con and they were like, it won't fit. <laughs> and I was like, that's a good point. It yeah. won't fit. Because theirs are for, uh, it's kind of, they, they have one for the Steam Deck and they make them for the uh, Aya Neo. Actually, yeah, that's what it is. The Aya Neo Air uh-huh. has sticks that feel very similar to the Switch Joy-Con, but I think okay. they're bigger and, and won't fit correctly. Um, so anyway, I don't know if this means anything because it seems like Nintendo's doing right by it anyway. If your Joy-Con well, has drift developed drift, it's worth remembering that your first point of contact should be Nintendo, uh, which will likely repair controllers at no cost. Uh, no cost to you, including shipping. So what was... Did you have to ship it to them? I had to ship it to them, yeah. And you paid for that ship? No. No? No, they sent me the shipping label and everything. They just told me to pack it up. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I didn't know that. From my own experience, you don't even need to provide proof of purchase, but it would certainly help your cause if you're within warranty. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense because it's a Joy-Con. Yeah. Like, w- w- it's their product. Like, of of course, somebody purchased it. Yeah. So somebody, you know, wants that thing to continue to work. Right. Um, Install Virus in the chat said, I hear you sending in your Joy-Con creates the chance of receiving some other replacement Joy-Con. Yeah. So that's something that's also worth talking about is, yeah, Nintendo will fix your Joy-Con uh, for free, but they're they're farming this job out to third-party repair shops. We've right. talked about it on the show before. Yeah. And these repair shops are overworked, understaffed, um, you know, working in not the best conditions. Uh, and mistakes like this happen where they will send back someone else's Joy-Con or they'll send back a Joy-Con that's not completely fixed, you know, or they're late in repairing your Joy-Con. So yeah, they're, they're doing right by the consumer, but at what cost basically? I, 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 I think that is something that's worth a consumer protection group like which yeah. going after them for, because you're sending in a uh, limited edition Joy-Con or whatever, and there's no guarantee that you're getting that one back. They're yeah. not fixing your product. They're giving you back a shittier version, right? which is a problem. You're, mm-hmm. you're, you're buying something that might stop working in, in yeah. like a month. And then that's just it. You're, you're out, you're out of luck. Yeah. And what if you purchase a limited edition Joy-Con, through a third party that's a lot more expensive yeah you're now just out all that money and that that's a huge problem what does this company which actually do <laughs> I, I keep calling them consumer protection but like i want to make sure a, i'm right it just says uk consumer group so i mean maybe it's like a consumer reports thing where like they look at companies and like tell you what you need to know about them or like the products they put which out. it like america test kitchen yeah Basically. Which is a U- United Kingdom brand name that promotes informed consumer choices in the purchase of goods and services by testing products, highlighting in- inferior products or services, raising awareness of consumer rights, and offering independent advice. So it sounds like America's Test Kitchen, yeah. except <laughs> for the part where they said uh, raising awareness of consumer rights. It doesn't sound like they actually lobby or do anything yeah. to help consumer rights. I think they just like <laughs> they're, just, they're just telling you of they the just mention rights. it basically. Okay, so this probably this fucking means yeah. nothing. They're fucking what's hey, what's how is this any different than me <laughs> deciding? Yeah, yeah, this thing uh, looks like Joy-Con drifts a thing. Yeah, <laughs> stupid. Um, but that's not the only thing that Europe. Is is is, no. is fighting Nintendo no. over specifically? Uh, where is it? Politicians in Nintendo, politicians in Europe are picking up on Nintendo's Smash World Tour cancellation and are asking questions if game companies should have the final say in who gets to run tournaments. Now, this, uh, if you scroll down, it's a translated version because I okay. think this is a uh, Norwegian. Oh boy, yeah. One of the comments says, uh, this is all great people outside of the U uh, of the EU like to shit on it, but I'm glad we got progressive governments like Norway and Sweden pushing for views like these. It's a good thing, if only because it gets the con- con- uh, conversation going. Nintendo's probably never going to face any repercussions in America, so let's hope Europe is a different story. And usually, if they face repercussions in other countries, they just blanket you know yeah fix things yeah it's kind of like you know how apple has to start making all their products with usb-c in europe so now they're 
they might do that in America. They really just might make all their phones wireless charging. Yeah, that heard that was yeah. MKBHD was talking about. That. Yeah, because some camera companies, uh, they're not allowed to sell cameras that like photo cameras that also do video unless the video is only a 30 minute limit on the video for some reason okay and a lot of camera companies uh just put a 30 lim minute limit on all of their cameras even the ones outside of the uk yeah. which sucks for us because yeah. that means we just get a 30 minute limit on our cameras yeah. for no fucking reason I think it like costs more to like oh, to sure say that your camera yeah. is a camcorder yeah. or a video camera. I don't know. But <clears throat> this is uh because of what happened did we talk we talked about it probably the last 2 weeks. Yeah. Uh Nintendo kind of shutting down Smash World Tour or mm -hmm. or they're playing very very dirty with a Smash Brothers uh uh tournament that was competing with uh their official partners mm -hmm. uh it was it, it, we had a whole episode about it and then there was more after that too it was very scummy and very dirty and uh nintendo could just get away with that and they're gonna yeah. face no repercussions and they're gonna still continue to think that they did nothing wrong uh panda global got kind of fucked out of it yeah. which is good uh but now it looks like uh i don't know Sweden or something is is is, <laughs> is coming is 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 coming to our one of those Scandinavian yeah. countries, Norway. Anyway, it says the cancellation of Smash World Tour made headlines in gaming press the world over. <clears throat> the Norwegian government is working on a dedicated gaming strategy, and both gaming and esports have been discussed a lot the last few years. This is uh, via Google Translate, so it might be a little yeah. rough. Earlier this year, Riot Games stopped Norway's largest esports series. Uh, from arranging League of Legends tournaments after many years of successfully doing so. So the whole issue with huge companies clamping down on grassroots initiatives is already something that was being discussed. Now, I, I never heard about that. Yeah, me neither. An opinion piece criticizing the game companies and pointing out the problems with esports ownerships all apparently ended up in the Norway Parliament where one of the sitting parties now has formally asked the government to co to comment on the inherent problems in esports citing the Nintendo cancellation and saying it's problematic that grassroots initiatives are being stopped i agree mm -hmm. the green party says gaming tournaments are being stopped because the game developers are threatening organizers with legal action if their tournaments are and events are using their games without permission or partnerships this is halting progress in esports and is creating a monopoly that is stunting ordinary people's opportunities to compute to compete and watch esports with uh what is the government going to do to address this problem and to ensure that tournaments can be held the norwegian government now has six days to formally reply politicians elaborate more in the article, it's important to stop these monopolies so that development of esports can happen on players' terms, not based on what is profitable for commercial companies at a given time. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that makes sense because like, I mean, look at Smash Brothers. Like, Nintendo doesn't want Smash esports to happen the way that it is because like they don't like the rule sets and yeah. they, they want people to... Uh, uh to view smash the way that they want it yeah. to be viewed you know so they're smashing them down left and right but like i don't know like the spalding have a right to like are they the company that makes the basketball yeah yeah do they have a right to to stop to stop you, basketball from happening <laughs> I, they don't no they don't have a right to stop you from taking a basketball to the park and playing you know hoops or whatnot no but do they have a right to be like this nba game can't happen well i don't know if they would have well actually it would be more like you know if people wanted to play you know just like a recreational game of basketball i mean yeah like maybe like i guess it would be more like a charity game of basketball and a team was wearing like nick's colors the well, Knicks would come and be like, don't do that. Well, the thing is, you're selling tickets. It's a commercial event. Because right. Because you're selling tickets to it and you're profiting off of it. Right. Um, and and game uh, uh, sports 
teams are very litigious. They are. They're yes. very, very <laughs> litigious. So that actually might happen. Yeah. If you, if you, you know. I guess a better example would be a film festival. Because I, yeah. I think in some cases you do have to get the rights from the film companies to show a film in a film festival. Mm-hmm. But I think there are also certain cases where you don't necessarily need to. I'm not clear on like the distinction between when you do and can't, don't need to get the rights from the distributor. Right. A so. skull bubble in the chat says the issue is broadcasting, and that's true. Yes. But then you're now we're in that really dicey territory where streaming a game is technically a yes. breach of copyright. <laughs> yes. But they just allow it because it's good advertising. Yes. Now I guess they view some tournaments as bad advertising. Yes. Which is ridiculous. Well, I mean, if it's like, I don't know, the Puppy Killers tournament, I wouldn't <laughs> want my game associated with that. Hey, their old old Smash community, plausible. Yes. <laughs> yeah. A little worse than Puppy Killing. Yeah. No, that. I know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I... I I don't know. I mean, Norway has a point here. They don't want companies like Nintendo to thwart these grassroots initiatives, but they own Nintendo owns the game. Yeah. So this is that's where it gets a little complicated. It's 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 their game. How much of a right do they have to control how it's viewed uh in 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 the form of like a tournament? Yeah, because like once you make the game and you sell it and it's out there, how much can you control how people use it? Well, that's, you know, going back to movies for a second, that's always been the argument with home video, because like if you, you know, you buy a if you buy like a DVD or a Blu-ray, like it says it's for residential use on the back. You know, you're not really allowed to play it outside of your house. (laughs) You know, if you if you try to like have a big showing of it, that's you know often frowned upon, and you know could result in legal action. So, I mean, with games, I mean something like this is also very similar. And the fact that they want to broadcast it on a bigger level, you know, is cause for concern for Nintendo. And to be clear, I, I'm not on Nintendo's side here. I think that I think it's ridiculous that they, you know, not just uh, Smash World Tour, but many tournaments, they are very they have very much like you know, antiquated ideas on. Um, and I think that they're long overdue for a change in how they think of not just esport competition, but like general online culture in general. You know? The, the the problem is that video games are in a weird middle ground between like movies and sports where yeah. like you somebody is playing it and creating their own content with it. Yeah. But it is also someone else's ip yes that can be viewed you, you know it's yeah. both it's it's not exactly like buying a basketball right. and using it and it's not exactly like showing a movie well i guess there's like two ways you can go about it you can go about it the way like capcom does with street fighter where like they know this is a thing they know people do this and they recognize that not only is it good advertising and PR for the game, it's, you know, good for the longevity of the series as a whole. Right. So, you know, they get it out there in the tournaments and they promote it on like Evo and things like that. And they make it from the, like the last few games have been made from the ground up to be tournament games, esports games. And that has been very good for the longevity of the series, even, you know, a lot of people didn't like the launch of Street Fighter V, but they have since fixed it and evolved it to be a highly competitive esports series. You can go the Capcom route or you can go the Nintendo route where every game is, you know, has to be done a certain... Every game has to be played the way Nintendo wants you to play it. So, so that... um, Yes. Sorry, I was looking at Stone Cold Steve Austin. I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> I was looking, I was looking at Stone Cold Steve Austin on my on my on my Twitter here. Well, hell yeah, that, son! That was that is because we're so used to game companies just just being okay with us streaming stuff. Yes, you know, yes. it's unfortunately 
it's it's just a it's just a handshake agreement between content creators and 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 video game developers. Mm -hmm. They know that in for the most part it's better for people to perceive their game unless the yeah. game sucks. Yes. Um in which case there have been cases of a game sucking, content creators playing it and then getting sued over it. Yes. <laughs> uh because the game sucks and they didn't want people to mm -hmm. see it in that way. Um but there's no laws saying that uh, we're allowed to play them in the way that we do, even just streaming it on Twitch. Yeah. So something as innocuous as streaming it on Twitch could be a problem for these companies and has been for Nintendo. Yes. Nintendo is the most egregious big company when it comes to uh, content creation, I yeah. guess, when it comes to trying to uh, claim their IP and whatever. So that's yeah. why their version of esports is such a like a like a like a bad example yeah of, of of how things could go so terribly wrong which is odd because you remember the the very first video for the switch like the very first trailer yeah. for the switch there was a big esports section at the end remember, like all the people were playing splatoon in a big arena yeah like they wanted the switch to be like an esports machine yeah and they're they're doing some weird bastardization version of esports weirdly they had splatoon yeah, like that was their big esport thing. I and, mean, that, and Splatoon esports, well, not I mean, really going. To be off. fair, that makes that you know Splatoon. Like I could see that as an esports game. It's a yeah. competitive shooter. Yeah, I could see. You it know, too. I just don't think Nintendo really understands esports or what makes a successful esports game. Right. You know, I think they wanted Splatoon to be an esports game, and the world said no. We want Smash Brothers, and Nintendo's like, fuck, fine. But we're doing it our way. Yeah, Nintendo was like, we'll do Smash the way we want to do it. And then yeah. they do it, and it sucks. Yeah. It's stupid. And then nobody wants it. And then uh, they won't just, you know, do it the way people yeah. want to do it. Like, imagine imagine if, like, 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 you made a game. People play it the way they want to play it. It's wildly successful the way they want to play it. And you're trying to force people to play it a different way. Yeah. Imagine if Fortnite came out. Yeah. And they were like, "No, don't play the battle royale. Play the play the main game." Yeah. And then they're like, "No, you can't play. Yeah. No, don't play it like that. You guys are playing our game wrong. You're yeah. not focusing on the right thing." And then they just turn off the battle royale. Imagine that. Anyway, there's more to this article. Uh, politicians elaborate more on the article. It's important to stop these monopolies so that development of esports uh, can happen on players' terms. Oh, I read that part already. We need to raise our own knowledge of the structural conditions around esports and the room for opportunity that exists politically to support the grassroots movements in these sports. We hope more politicians, both in Norway and internationally, see the need for more regulation that ins ensures a uh, diverse and democratic development of esports and take action to ensure this asked if esports can be regulated at all M quote most things can be regulated and esports is no different that sounds threatening <laughs> <laughs> well this is just in a small country so far nintendo has nevertheless now ended up in political discussions and now in a way i think they and not in a way that i think that they wanted the EU has just a few months ago voted to create a large unified video game strategy and game company ownership w were brought up as the single biggest issue with esports. There is uh, there as well. Norway's barking about this now might attract the EU's interest. Another thing I wanted to bring up is that uh, the game company that owns the uh ip of the game that is being played in the tournament yes how much uh involvement should they have they should have involvement right right but how much because like it's their game yeah. for example uh a player on panda global ended up winning the panda global tournament right or like got really far in like their their thing yeah. it's like you set up the tournament and now one of your players won and it's also you're in collaboration with nintendo yeah so like a nintendo guy won the tournament yeah so it's like is there like some favoritism yeah, that, like, some, like what's yeah. going on like how do we ensure that there's no foul play going yeah. on yeah i mean i feel like if this could be like the easiest thing in the world to just solve 
like I'm sure like if Nintendo had a, like a list of reasonable guidelines, like people would accept it and use it. But right. it seems like they don't have a list of reasonable guidelines. It seems like their guidelines are no. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. It, I mean, companies like that leave it ambiguous so that they can just say no for whatever reason. Yeah. But it should just they should just take a while, mm -hmm. write a big document. Uh, some of these esports uh, companies have some massive rule documents. Yeah. Uh, I was reading the rules on what controllers you're allowed to use, and it reads like like a, like a law, like legalese. Yeah. It, it, the way that they list out exactly what type of buttons you can have. Yeah. Um, Nintendo needs to sit down and have like a pamphlet of like uh, guidelines. Yeah. And if you meet all of these criteria, then you can be uh, an officially licensed tournament. And if you don't meet the criteria, then no. And they should have came up with that criteria with Panda Global. Yeah, but they didn't. <laughs> but they didn't. And there's still time to come up with criteria yeah. like that, but... Uh, you know, because we know there's going to be another Smash Brothers or something along the Even with Ultimate, you can still retroactively add it to Ultimate. Yeah. No, yeah, there's still time to have Ultimate guidelines, mm -hmm. but... Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh... Install viruses. Nintendo should just port Melee to Steam and watch the pesos roll in. <laughs> you have a bigger chance of Nintendo completely redoing their esports yeah. uh, guidelines than you do have them porting uh, Melee to Steam. Now, did you see Melee received a big update lately? Melee? Melee, yes. So people have been playing Melee online via a thing called Slippy. Okay. Uh, and now there's a ranked mode. Oh. So people, like all of the big Melee players, uh, have been ranking. They're, yeah. they're, they're, they're doing a little online ranked mode. Interesting. It's via an emulator. Yeah. But they also have a thing, I think it's also through Slippy, where you can play on an actual GameCube and it mirrors it on the computer. Huh. They do that in some tournaments. And that's why some tournaments didn't meet the requirements for Nintendo and, right. and got shut down. Uh it's really cool though. You could play on a GameCube and then you can have like stats and stuff get yeah. thrown up on other screens. You can like zoom in on specific characters because you have a free range of a spectator mode. Yeah. You know, you could play back stuff in real time and just play back the game data and not have an actual video. Right. So you could play something back and like zoom in and like bring the camera around and see what actually happened. It's fucking awesome. Yeah. But uh, Nintendo's like, no. You're not allowed to do that. Any other game company would look at that and say, that's cool. You can add an extension to our game or that's cool. We'll do it ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, there, uh, Metascension sh uh, dropped this in the chat before. Uh, this is Gully Kit's Joy-Con uh, stick. Okay. But... I don't think it is. It, so so it's a hall sensing stick that looks like a Joy-Con stick. But do they say that it's a Joy-Con? Because I'm, uh, I think I, after this, I DM'd them and they said this wasn't going to fit. Nothing's showing up on screen. Oh, cool, dude. <laughs> awesome. Is that, what is it? Okay. Uh, there it is. Hooray! It, it looks like a Joy-Con thumbstick. But... Yes. Um, Will this work as drop and replacement for Switch products and Elves controllers? Not this one, but we are working on another one for that. So okay. this, I, I think this is the Ioneo Air Joy-Con. Right. I mean, maybe this is a prototype. Maybe this is just the, the first step towards True. It, it, it could Switch. be that. Yeah. I remember. Oh, maybe I could... I mean, I don't want to, like, dox them with my DMs with them. Right. Uh, just trying to see if anyone thought I saw something. Nintendo is stuck in the past. They still want the glory days of the wizard. Oh, like, like, like the movie? Yeah. I've never seen that movie. I actually have. It's kind of, it's kind of a sweet movie for, like, a bad movie. Oh, uh, so... Gully Kid says they are working on 
they're working on a Joy-Con. Right. As of September. But yeah, that one is not that. And also, uh, the Aya Neo Air ones uh, will not work because the voltage is different. Yeah. Beat 'em Ups says, I love that movie. It's underrated. We should all have a movie night. I'd be down. I'd be down. You have you have time for that? <laughs> no, I, I do not. <laughs> I'm just saying I would be down if I had time for that. What was the last movie I watched? <sighs> I don't even know. Spider-Man uh, Far From Home on a Plane. You, just, you didn't see Batman? Oh, no, I did see the Batman. All right. No, but I saw Spider-Man after I saw the Batman. Okay. Yeah. I'm still, still trying to work my way through Andor. Yeah, me too. Bad. I got through the second episode, and I was like, why do people like this show? It's boring. Oh, my God. Like, don't. <laughs> okay. Look. Look. I, uh, hear, I hear it gets better after the second episode. I think I'm I on my... Epi- I, a friend of mine, before we started watching, was like, you got to plow through the first three episodes, then it becomes the best Star Wars thing on the planet. I'm on, like, episode seven or eight. It is not the best Star Wars thing on the planet. It's very good. Okay. I enjoy it. I it is it is not as good as Mandalorian season one. It's not as good as the original trilogy. It's not as good as Rogue One. Ooh. It is not as good as those other two Disney Star Wars movies that everybody likes to Is fight it about. as good as Mandalorian season two? So here's here's my problem with Mandalorian season two. Okay. Mandalorian season two is elevated fan film. Okay, which basically means it, they they made a fan film with a with a Disney budget because they took the story that they had and decided to add uh well let's add Boba Fett let's add Ahsoka Tano let's add Luke Skywalker let's just add all the characters I like yeah that's awesome <sighs> it I'm a fan I want to be serviced like I get it but that only works to a point. Okay. That only works up to a certain point. And we saw the limit of that with the book of Boba Fett. <laughs> oh, yeah. The book of Boba Fett was not good. And, like, that Luke Skywalker reveal at the end of the Mandalorian, <gasps> there are only so many times you could have made that happen and be and, like, work. And they used their one, and then they tried to do their number two, eh, poop, way too soon. <laughs> Wood says the Mandalorian 2 was very forgettable and the Luke thing was vomit inducing. What are you talking about? That was fucking awesome. I understand why people don't like the Luke I, reveal at the end. I do think Mandalorian season two was pretty boring until the until that. And then I was like, holy shit, this is fucking I, awesome. I think the thing with the thing with the Luke reveal at the end was like the whole point of like the Mandalorian and um Andor and you know all these other things is trying to get away from these like tell other stories in the star wars universe outside of the skywalker saga that's what i want from andor and rogue one that's what i want right well that's also what people want from the mandalorian Mm -hmm. and then they still find ways to tie it back to the same cast of character You're, you're basically taking this big expansive universe and making it smaller yeah and star wars if anything should be a big expansive universe yeah I did not like Obi Wan for similar reasons because I'm just sick of that. <laughs> I'm sick of that. Stuff. I liked Obi Wan because I find it interesting what happens when a man is at his lowest point and like how does he deal with that? And that's basically what Obi Wan was about. That's fine. Yes, that's nothing wrong with that. They had they introduced all these characters that were uh, just an absolute waste of time. Hey, they wasted so they wasted so much potential on these on these other characters. The red hot chili peppers were in Obi Wan, yeah. and there's nothing in those in the show that says that that wasn't the red hot chili peppers. <laughs> <laughs> just straight up, just the red straight hot up. Chili yes, peppers. it was Flea and the rest of the red hot chili peppers. <laughs> <laughs> I I I'm gonna find my way through Andor. I, yeah. I, I, what I want out of Andor is more Rogue One. Which Rogue One was uh, well, I mean, Rogue One was Star Wars without the lightsabers and whatever until it's the a, end. Uh, yeah, and then that was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, we got notifications here. Yes, we got. Oh God, I'm so far behind. Uh, Luke Anton with 36 months. Razzle Jazzle with the gift of sub. King Shiro Neko, thanks for the 21 months. Spoopy Girl, thanks for the 21 months. It's been a bit, but so glad be- here before Xmas with the Wolf Bros. How you doing? Good hey, how's it going? Should have put a like a like a fire on here. 
Oh, yeah. yeah. That would have made sense. Uh, Dark type with 10 gifted subs. Damn, son. And then $10. Merry Christmas and happy holidays, Wolf Bros. And fans, I love you so much. Oh, my God. Oh, Dark type. Thank you. Dark type comments on every single video. He does. He's like the first one. Yeah. Uh,. Andor gets really good after the first two. All right, well, I'm on the third, so we'll see. I do like uh, Chris BX said, isn't that how life works? Most of the supporting cast is worthless and forgettable. That's a good point. I do like um, what uh, Tony Gilroy, the showrunner of Andor, said about like people's main criticism of prequels in general is like, why would you watch it? You know how it's going to end. And his response was, well, you know how your life is going to end. <laughs> your whole life is a prequel. So <laughs> That's a good point. I'm going to start saying that. I did not know how uh, Rogue One was going to end. I mean, I yeah. I knew what was going to happen. What was supposed to happen? Yeah, yeah, and then and then I didn't know what they were going to show. Yeah. you know that was crazy. Yeah. You know, what's the cr- I I think the best example of you already know what's going to happen is Inglorious Bastards. Yeah, <laughs> because you know what's going to happen, and you're like, yeah, I know. All right, I know yeah. the story of World War Two. I know, and then and then. There's the twist, yeah. yeah there's a twist. You're like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> that they they mess with your expectations. Yeah. Uh. Anyway. Uh. Well, all right. We did notifications. Yes. Now uh, we're not we'll, done with uh, lawsuits. <laughs> no. There's more legal stuff. Yes. It. <laughs> oh wait. No. This is with. This is America. Yeah. So, USA. 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 <laughs> so in the past, uh, it was it was the UK who was doing something. Yeah. They were investigating the uh, Microsoft acquisition of Activision. Yeah. They seem to be, uh, not that they were leading the charge, but they seem to be like the ones most heavily looking into like any shady dealings or any anti-competitive right. um, intentions of this merger. Right. You know, the FTC here in this country, like they filed a lawsuit, but I think we talked about it. It's not like really like trying to stop it. It's just like a general investigation into it. Uh, however, gamers, that's us, <laughs> we are it. suing Microsoft to thwart the merger with Activision. Uh, the Clayton Antitrust Act of 1914 gives Americans the right to sue companies over anti-competitive behavior, a fact which 10 self-described gamers are using to take Microsoft to court, aiming to halt the company's rep- uh, acquisition of Activision. As reported by Bloomberg Law, the complaint filed today uh, and obtained by Kotaku uh, states that the plaintiff or video gamers, that's in quotes, uh, as they're described, are concerned that the Microsoft and Activision merger may substantially lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. Uh, This merger, the complaint states, would specifically be in violation of Section 7 of the Clayton Law, um, which states that acquisitions that diminish competition and prohibit U.S. uh, uh, Sorry. Acquisitions that diminish competition are prohibited under U.S. antitrust law. The complaint not only cites the scale and scope of the Activision and Microsoft merger as problematic, but also that this uh, latest proposed union follows numerous other Microsoft acquisitions, ranging from the 2014 purchase of Mojang all the way up to its acquisition of Rare in 2022. That uh, That's a misprint. I think they acquired Rare uh, in 2002, if I'm not mistaken. Oh my God, write them a letter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, although it's... Uh, thoroughly laying out console, PC, and AAA gaming, as well as subscription services as relevant product markets, the suit calls attention to just how many large franchises will fall under Microsoft's corporate umbrella should the merger go through. Call of Duty, World of Warcraft, Minecraft, Doom, Microsoft Flight Simulator, Halo, and The Elder Scrolls are just some of the cited examples. It maintains that currently Microsoft and Activision compete directly through these uh, through these titles and services like Battle.net, the Microsoft Store, and Game Pass. The merger would shatter that competitive dynamic. Should the merger go through the suit claims, Microsoft could hold outsized market power and the ability to foreclose key inputs to rival and further harm competition. The suit mentions that competitive that competition, both whereas it concerns uh, sales to consumer, as well as competition in the industry to hire and retain talent within specialized video game labor, uh, which could be lessened under the merger. Uh, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean it makes sense. Uh, it's it's a big corporation. 
buying another big buying corporation another big in the same field. Yeah. Um, Which happens all the time. And in this case, uh, I mean, we're talking about video, like, we're talking about video games. Yeah. What are the, when we think of the biggest game companies, we think of the big three, which is Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo. Yes. However, uh, if we're thinking biggest, largest games. I think that's com- technically Tencent. Yeah. Yeah. In the world. I want like a rank. I think the number one is Tencent. Yeah. Uh, this is of 2022. Largest game companies in the world. This is a Yahoo.com article. <laughs> I didn't know they're still around. Uh, let's go all the way to number one, which is... Hello? <laughs> Click here to continue reading. Oh, God. Oh, oh God. It's not just like a Wikipedia article with all this. D- didn't they get rid of wiki lists? I don't know, man. Oh, my God. I'm going through some inside insider monkey is the website I'm on right now. Microsoft. OK, does Microsoft count? I mean, yeah, they're a video game company, but the whole of Microsoft, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That seems a little, uh, well, okay. Well, if you think about this in the lens that Microsoft is the biggest game company and they're acquiring another massive game company, yeah. then then th- there, okay. there might be some grounds for, for for being upset. I mean, I've never heard of this website, All Top Everything. Okay. Um, but they list, uh, as of 2022, the number one is Sony. Interesting. Uh, the website I'm on says Microsoft, and then number two is NetEase, and number three is Tencent. Yeah. Um, this is based on revenue. So number one is Sony, number two is Microsoft, number three is Nintendo, number four is Tencent, and number five is Activision Blizzard. You said number three was Nintendo? Yeah. Nintendo is number five on mine. This also yeah. says it's by revenue, by the way. <laughs> okay. What does it say Nintendo's revenue is? Uh, twelve point forty four billion. All right, this says fifteen point three billion. Trailing twelve month revenue. The all right. So the point of the matter is, you know, Activision is up there in like the top game companies. So Activision wasn't in mine. What was it on yours? Five. Number five. Activision number eight on this random okay. list. So yeah, my point was that there's a. It's not just the big three. There's a lot of different game companies. Right. I feel like this would be less in the press if it was like Bandai Namco Holdings yeah. buying Activision Blizzard, you know? Well, I mean, if you think about it, it was less in the press when it was Bethesda yeah. that got bought by Microsoft. That's Bethesda. True. Well, they were smaller. They were smaller, but they were still like a major AAA studio. Yeah, they, they were had, still worth a lot. They, The Elder Scrolls, Fallout, uh, Doom, Wolfenstein. You know, major popular video game series that are now under the Microsoft umbrella. GameStop is number 10 on this list. <laughs> That's weird. Yes. That's strange. Uh, oh, and Square Enix is number 15 on this list. This Ooh. is the last spot on the list. Okay. And Square Enix is the one trying to get bought here. Yeah. Now, do you think anybody will bat an eye if Square Enix gets bought by Sony? Yes. You think so? I think so. Because, well, I mean, I don't know, because now, now Square Enix isn't like all the Western titles anymore. It's not Tomb Raider. It's not Deus Ex. It's not anything like that. But, I mean, Final Fantasy is a big deal. Yeah. And, you know, I know it's not synonymous with Microsoft, but it is synonymous with Nintendo to a point. So, they, you know, that might be cause for concern. Are they going to start releasing their games on Nintendo again? Yeah. Or is it only like old games get released on Nintendo? So Microsoft has been uh, trying to play the PR rounds by yes. saying that uh, they're going to support Call of Duty on other consoles for 10 years. They committed to do it to Sony, but Sony saw through their yes. their their kindness and was like, no, you're just trying to get one over on the FTC. We're not going to yeah. buy it. Nintendo's like, we don't okay. give a shit. Yeah, we'll do whatever. We don't. <laughs> okay, we're just happy to be here. Yeah, we're happy to be here. We don't want to give yeah. you anything anyway. We don't, we're not going to. Uh, Nintendo doesn't see. I don't think Nintendo could lose if Microsoft buys Activision. No. I don't think they. there's anything that matters to them. No. There's already not a lot of Activision stuff on yeah. Switch. 
Skylanders was a launch title or like the first week of launch or yeah. something. Uh, and uh, there was there was no third parties on Switch at the time. Yeah. So Activision kind of supported the Switch a little bit when it launched, uh, but that was it. They didn't really yeah. do anything else. So getting Call of Duty on the Switch, kind of a huge deal. And, yeah. and Nintendo doesn't care if, if uh, the, the merger goes through or not. They're going to still continue to keep doing what they're doing. Yeah. They're not trying to be on top. They're just trying to 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 do good things over there. Um, Sony seems to want to fight about it. Yeah, <laughs> I will say like this lawsuit that's been brought up is like probably the most you know detailed reasons as to why this is bad mm-hmm. because it's not just talk because Sony's main argument is they're going to lose Call of Duty. Yeah. Okay. One game, which is r- ridiculous. This. <clears throat> Goes into more detail about how, you know, Microsoft will then own like a majority of the most popular franchises in the world. They will make it exclusive to Microsoft platforms. Um, the fact that Battle.net and, uh, you know, is a competitor to the Microsoft store in general. So what happens there? Do they merge? Do they be kept separate? What does that mean? Uh, yeah, it's. It's crazy that like it you know it took the people to bring this the like actual concerns yeah. to the forefront. I'm gonna blow my nose. Oh, you blow your nose. Uh so this said the FTC isn't the only one saying hang here a minute. So so who exactly is filing the complaint? A according to Bloomberg Law, a uh Filed today and obtained by Kotaku states that the plaintiffs or video gamers, as I described, are concerned. Okay, so who? Uh, According to the Bloomberg article, the federal antitrust lawsuit filed in San Francisco comes less than two weeks after. It just says a group of gamers. (laughs) That. A group of gamers challenged the deal in court. Who's the group? You can't just do that. <laughs> Cause of action, Section 7 of the Clayton Act. Attorneys, the gamers are represented by a Leoto Law Firm, a Leoto Legal, and Joseph Savory Law Firm, LLP. It sounds like a law firm that's just bored. <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. If you go to, you can actually view like the document okay. on Bloomberg and it lists like all the people, the, all the plaintiffs, the people suing Microsoft. And it looks like it's just a bunch of dudes <laughs> who got Where together. Where did you click? Uh, oh, wait. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. I'm going to pull this up on screen. Yeah. Dante oh, DiMartini, have- Curtis Burns Jr., Nicholas Eldon, uh, Jesse Galvin, uh, Christopher Joseph, Gig. Uh, Gideon's Lafayette, Lafay, uh, Steve Her- uh, Herrera, Hunter Joseph, uh, Daniel Dermont, Alfred L- Wait, uh, oh, I see Loftus, them. Beowulf Edward Owen. I'm gonna I'm gonna Google the first guy. Okay. Uh, Dante DiMartini. I think you'll have an easier time uh, googling Beowulf Edward. Account oh, sales wow. representative of Bay Area. Are we doxing right now? Hold on. <laughs> this might be doxing, but it's all public. Uh, this guy like playing video games in his spare time? Maybe. Oh, here. Uh, in the document. It, if you scroll down to um, page seven. <laughs> okay. It. Uh, yeah, it'll tell you. Uh, the plaintiffs named below are individual citizens of the cities and states listed. Each plaintiff is a consumer of video games, all of, all with the express interest and intent in ensuring that the industry remains competitive with the utmost innovation, output, choice, and price, constra- uh, price constraints now and in the future. The potential acquisition of Activision Blizzard by Microsoft threatens loss and harm to the plaintiffs uh, and to the public at large of the salutary benefits of substantial competition within the video games industry uh first one dante d martini is a video ga- is a video gamer located in san francisco uh mr d martini plays video games on the playstation console and on his personal computer using windows os 
Uh, Mr. Demartini plays or has purchased titles from Activision Blizzard, including multiple versions of Call of Duty, World of Warcraft, Overwatch, Overwatch 2, StarCraft 2, Diablo 3, and Hearthstone. Skip to Beowulf. Okay. Beowulf Edward Owen is a video gamer located in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Mr. Owen plays video games on his personal computer using the Windows operating system and Xbox consoles. Okay. Mr. Owen plays or has purchased titles from Activision Blizzard, including Call of Duty and Overwatch. So this man seems to benefit (laughs) from this acquisition. Well, yes, but, I mean, he plays on Windows computers. I think right now, if you want to buy an Activision Blizzard game, you have to do it through Battle.net. Right. Moving that over, like... I know Microsoft said like they when they buy call then when they buy Call of Duty they'll put it on Steam, um, but who's to say you know if they'll take it off of Battle.net and move it over to a game, Xbox PC? Yeah, you and know, what's the like what's that. the problem with that? It's a di- people are very particular with their launchers. Yes, I think unifying the launchers can only be a good thing. It is, yeah. You know, I mean, I I mean nobody likes the Microsoft launcher. No. And no, nobody likes the Battle.net launcher either. Yeah, that's everyone a good likes point. the Steam launcher. That's a good point. You the know? problem is having too many launchers. Right. That's the problem. Yeah. I remember a time when we bought Half Life Two and it came with Steam, and we were like, "What the fuck is yeah. this?" Yeah. It wasn't just everybody hated Steam. Yep. Now everybody loves Steam. <laughs> this is a very strange. Uh, uh, this is a very strange uh, 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 lawsuit going on right here. Yeah. <sighs> It's a strange lawsuit, but it's not a. I don't think it's a frivolous one. No, I mean there's some ba- there's some basis, but it's 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 just very funny that it's <laughs> it's just a random like random uh, collection of like gamers. It's a random uh, uh 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 attorney. Yeah, and it's a random collection of gamers that they had to have like head hunted like they would like extras in a commercial or something. Hunter Joseph Jukko is a video gamer located in Los Angeles, California. Hunter Joseph plays video games on Xbox and PlayStation consoles, as well as his personal computer using Apple OS. Oh, he's definitely screwed. <laughs> this, is this is this true? Can we get Hunter Joseph on the podcast? I'd like to question. I'm sure we could get his one Apple of these OS people. gaming. I'm sure we can get one of these people on the podcast. Mr. Jukko plays or has purchased titles from activision blizzard including call of duty modern warfare 2 call of duty warzone 2 which you cannot purchase yeah uh and is also not a game really it's just called call of duty warzone uh world of warcraft and overwatch 2 one of these guys is from new jersey i'm sure we can just go find them go get them <laughs> go get them what a strange thing i mean that uh I'm more okay with this than I am the weird sort of like uh, uh, finger pointing that PlayStation is doing. Yeah. At least this seems like there's like some basis behind it. Yeah. Because like, you know, we don't want to create monopolies here in America. Yeah. We, that's that, that's a... Uh, yeah. No. So, the biggest uh, uh, a problem that could happen in a capitalist society. Yeah. Well, not the biggest problem, but it's a big problem that's very easy to happen in a capitalist society. Right. So we need some sort of protection yeah. against that. No, it it, def- it just it seems like Sony's big argument is they're going to take Call of Duty from us. Yeah, you know, which I feel like yeah, that's a big deal. But you know, you're you're missing the forest for the trees here. You know, there's there's a much bigger things at stake than just one video game franchise. There's a lot of video game franchises right. at stake. Yeah, many of them more closely associated with the PlayStation name than Call of Duty is. Yeah, and now here's PlayStation with a million exclusives. Yeah, <laughs> like. <laughs> Anyway, that's a that's a big like Microsoft uh, counter argument. It's like, look how many exclusives Sony has. Look how many game of, game of the year awards they win. We don't have that. Yeah, <laughs> we need something instead of just creating all these studios and having them make games. We'll just buy pre existing studios. In, in defense of Microsoft, they give their they let their games go on other platforms. Yeah, you know they have. Yeah, but I mean, Sony does put games on PC. So they're they throwing put, a little bow in every once in a while. And, you know, MLB, the show, has been appearing on other systems now. Mm-hmm. Now it used to be a PlayStation exclusive series. That is true. Well, that they were going to lose that if they didn't yeah. If they didn't put it on other systems. Uh, 360 degrees of, of Tasmania. 
that's the name. Thanks for 510 bits. Love your content. The girlfriend videos on the Nintendo podcast was lit. Valve Steam Deck is now available in Australia via Amazon. Oh, that's interesting. Which of the three models do you recommend? I ask as the costs are $1,200, $1,408, and $1,725. Holy shit. Uh, I got the middle one. Yeah. But that was only because I thought that was the only way to upgrade the storage. Like, I I thought that the first one wasn't going to have upgradable storage. Right. Uh, but they all have upgradable storage. Right. So it will just look at the amount of storage that you want. Uh, if you don't want to upgrade yourself, uh, you can get any of them, to be completely honest. Uh, with you. Well, I think a big thing, too, is the most expensive model has, like, a nicer screen. So if that's really important to you. Uh, I haven't uh, I haven't seen a comparison yet. I, I Jackson had the more expensive one, uh-huh. uh, and it didn't really seem that much nicer to me but i didn't do a direct comparison because my steam deck was dead <laughs> uh so i don't know how much different it, it, it how how much is actually worth it yeah uh i don't know if getting the most expensive one is worth it if the price differences are, are the way that they are yeah um but yeah i mean it's just it's 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 it's, it's up to you really I'll, if you're gonna play emulated games they all run great through through the sd card mm-hmm. and honestly most games work just fine on the sd card so you'll be the inter the, the storage doesn't matter you can upgrade it later uh all right oh that was all in australian dollars okay yeah it's still a lot of money though well yeah the uh australia has like that really high like import tax yeah it's very hard to be a gamer outside of america and yes japan all right what's next here uh well no more lawsuits good instead mario kart 7 oh wait is that it no the super nintendo world opens in february in america yeah. usa usa and uh has a mario kart uh ride yes it's vr uh ar it's ar yeah uh two years after nintendo uh super nintendo world's opening in osaka japan its first american counterpart will arrive and universal studios hollywood like the japanese version hollywood super nintendo world is less of a self-contained theme park and more of a new area at universal studios somebody was complaining about this saying that they should go through a warp pipe to get to it and they do (laughs) You go through a warp pipe, so I don't understand. I think they mean a literal, like, like a stand-up one, but instead of one that's laying. That flat. seems problematic. Like, like, that, like people are gonna get hurt. Yeah, and also, it's still a warp pipe. <laughs> <laughs> there are sideways warp pipes. True. Um, roughly coinciding with the release of the Super Mario Brothers movie, the California theme land will open February seventeenth, twenty twenty-three. Uh, Mario Kart Bowser's Challenge is the centerpiece attraction, an augmented reality powered go kart simulator inspired by Nintendo's racing franchise. Attendees wear AR visors displaying an alternate uh, digital world with fantastical tr- uh, racetracks, Koopa shells, and familiar competitors uh, who you blast using your steering wheel trigger. Unfortunately, although Nintendo and Universal believe the attraction includes enough variety to invite repeat visits, it's Super Nintendo World's only proper ride at launch. The Japan Park only has one other ride, a slower-paced Yoshi Adventure, which hasn't been announced for the U.S. Interesting. Beyond AR Mario Kart, the park invites you to simulate to stimulate your senses and spend money. You can buy a power-up band, which helps families keep score and unlock extra special attractions uh, with question mark blocks and costume characters. Additionally, if the ride's AR visor wasn't enough, you can pick up a pair of interactive binoculars to discover a new dimension to Super Nintendo World. You can also buy lunch at Toadstool Cafe, where Chef Toad serves delicacies like Toadstool Cheesy Garlic Knots, Piranha Plant, Caprese, and Mario Bacon Cheeseburger. And, of course, there's the 1UP Factory, a retail shop selling a bunch of crap. Uh, It sounds like uh, the Toadstool uh, food place is better in Japan. Doesn't surprise me. They like strawberry shortcakes Doesn't surprise me. Uh bar in the chat says but there are lay down pipes in mario you gotta phrase that a little better it's <laughs> not the way you phrase that yeah trying to convince my wife to have us go to uni- this universal studios and not harry potter world in florida 
are, are there plans to get Super Nintendo World in Florida? I believe so. You'll have an easier time getting me to go there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because our parents go to Florida all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, if you can wait for them to open it up in Florida, then you can do two, I'd kill two birds with one stone. I'd still rather go all the way to Japan and go to the one in Japan. Well, yeah. I'm sure than, that's Than like, to go to California. Yeah. I don't want to go to California just for this. <laughs> yeah. It, it seems very small, too. Uh, even the one in Japan seems small, but this seems... Like well, they like they said, it's not a full park. It's like an, yeah. it's like an area of the park yeah. that they made into like a Nintendo themed. Like I'm excited that there's a Nintendo theme park, but it doesn't seem worth the whole trip, you know? Right. To just go all the way to California just for the opening of yeah. this. Unless I'm invited. There you go. <laughs> if you wanna you wanna bring me balls in your court, everything? Nintendo yeah. slash universal. Universal Nintendo yeah. would never. Oh yeah, Universal <laughs> is a is a is a big maybe. Yeah. Um, when is this opening? Uh, February seventeenth next year. And when's the movie? March. Uh, May. So I think it's an M. <laughs> April. April seventh. Oh wow, I was off. Yeah. Uh, okay, so they open this uh before the movie. Yes. Okay. That makes a lot of sense too. Uh, this came very quickly. I wasn't. Yeah, I didn't I'm think very this surprised. Going to be ready. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but again, it's been open in Japan for a while, so I'd rather just go to that one. Yeah. I don't need this one in my life. But I'm glad. You know, if you're on the West Coast, have fun. I'm sure you'll enjoy. Uh, okay. Now we can talk about Mario Kart Seven. Yes, Mario Kart Seven uh, gets its first update in ten years. This is strange. Uh, most of us have probably settled in quite comfortably with Mario Kart Eight by now. After all, it's been out for almost nine years on the Wii U, uh, while the Switch Deluxe, Deluxe Edition has been around since 2017. However, Nintendo's most recent Mario Kart update was not for Mario Kart Eight, but it was for its predecessor, the 3DS's Mario Kart Seven. This update, or to give it its official name, a version 1.2 update, is the first update that this game has received in little over 10 years. Here are the full notes from Nintendo. Several issues have been addressed to improve a gameplay experience, and that's and that's your lot. Uh, although, as pointed out by serial Nintendo code source uh, Oatmeal Dome, this update is also likely to address the same security bugs as other Nintendo games which received unexpected updates last month. So yeah, it's... Uh, Several issues have been addressed to improve the gameplay experience. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's all. That's all it's done. But what's strangest about this is, isn't this the 3DS this game? This is the 3DS game, yes. That's why it's so weird. Yeah. Because aren't they... What was the last 3DS game to get an update? Aren't they shutting down yeah. the 3DS eShop? Yeah. Yeah, this is a very strange yeah. thing. And like, why now? Why 10 years and Yeah, later? this is the first game. This is the first update the game's received at all in the yeah. in, in, in 10 years. Yeah. No updates in 10 years. That's ridiculous. Uh, there's even possibility that this patch fixes the same security bugs as the other games since Mario Kart 7 is a first-party Nintendo game and could use a lot of the same common netcode that was found to be vulnerable. They must have some sort of data that... Uh, this game is still being played a lot yeah. online and, and, and stuff. I remember seeing another tweet from Oatmeal Dome that went more in detail. He like quote tweeted somebody else. Uh, here it is. Uh, here's some information on the version 1.2 update from the CTGP7 project lead. Uh, it seems the primary changes were made to the net code, but they cannot give more details. The other changes are just safeguards to prevent version 1.1 from playing with 1.2. To me, I, I cannot give more details heavily implies that security bugs were submitted to Nintendo's bug bounty program, but Nintendo has not given their permission to make the details public yet. In a bounty program, researchers submit info about bugs in exchange for cash. So maybe this guy who said there's up to, uh, who who said he knows what changes were made. Yeah. Maybe he's part of the bug bounty program and he's yeah. like legally obligated not to to say. I finished calculating the difference between the new Mario Kart 7 uh version 1.2 update here are all of them of the game's 20,000 plus functions. 27 functions have been changed, two new functions have been added, a smaller compiler glitch disappeared. Okay. So 
bug fixes. Yes. <laughs> um, it's just a small, stupid update, but the interesting thing is that they haven't it's, updated this yes. game in 10 years, and it's a freaking 3DS game. Yeah. Nintendo, uh, I mean, usually doesn't support their games for very long, and yeah. uh, they used to be good at like backwards compatibility and like supporting their older games, but it seems like 3DS they're 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 keeping they're, their distance from now. Yeah, especially you know they're they really are like trying to put the 3DS out the pasture, make you forget about it. Yeah, and just focus on the Switch. Uh, Colin A, thank you for the Prime subscription. Uh, let's talk about John Carmack. Yes, I read his statement and this was awesome. <laughs> John Carmack uh, quits Meta, burns his virtual bridges behind him. Uh, Meta's pivot away from social media and into virtual reality has hit another snag. One of the company's executives, John Carmack, who helped build Meta's Oculus company as chief technology officer, is stepping away from Meta amidst frustration over the company's efficiency. Uh, Carmack stepped into the role of CTO for Oculus, now called Reality Labs, in 2013 and is shutting the door behind him after nearly 10 years, having served as a consulting CTO since 2019. Wow, it's really been 10 years since... Oh, my God. Jesus. For reference, John Carmack is uh, one of the guys who made Doom. He's one of the founders of id Software. So, And he was like the guy who created the engines for Wolfenstein 3D and Doom and Quake. And, and a lot of people took that doom engine and ran with it yes and especially like i remember like back in the day every game ran on the quake 3 engine which was all him yeah he is he is one of the smartest people in gaming he is one of the you know most forward thinkers in like creating video game engines yeah the man is a genius he's one of the most important developers in the history of gaming yeah he uh changed the way a lot of games run and stuff and he left id company he founded to go work at, at the time, Oculus, because he believed in VR so much. Yeah, and then he got they got bought out by Facebook and yeah. got stuck working at Facebook. Uh, it, honestly, when they got bought, he was probably part of the acquisition. Like, like, yeah. like, like this guy can't leave like, yeah. kind of thing. Like, like yeah. he's written into the contract. Like, we need him to stick around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, news broke this weekend of Carmack's departure after, according to Carmack, he shared an internal memo within the company that was leaked to the press. Carmack shared the entirety of the memo with one edit to his Facebook account on Friday. Uh, in the letter, Carmack describes how he has been satisfied with the technology that Oculus has produced, but is unhappy with the way the company is being run. Uh, the issue is our efficiency, Carmack wrote in the letter. He elaborated, we have a ridiculous amount of people and resources, but we constantly self-sabotage and squander effort. There is no way to sugarcoat this. I think our organization is operating at half the effectiveness that would make me happy. That would make me happy, <laughs> specifically, <laughs> is what he said. Uh, Carmack explains in a follow-up paragraph the internal friction that even he, as a top executive, felt while trying to guide the company in a more proactive direction. Quote, It has been a struggle for me. I have a voice at the highest levels here, so it feels like I should be able to move things, but I am evidently not persuasive enough. A good fraction of things I complain about eventually turn my way after a year or two passes and evidence piles up, but I have never been able to kill stupid things before they cause damage or set a direction and have a team actually stick to it. I think my influence at the margins has been positive, but it has never been a prime mover. Uh, Meta's chief technology officer, Andrew Bosworth, responded to Carmack's letter on Twitter, stating, John, uh, is impossible. it is impossible to overstate the impact you've had on our work and the industry as a whole. Your technical prowess is widely known, but it is your relentless focus on creating value for people that we will remember most. Thank you and see you in VR. I don't think you're going to see him in VR. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there, there's a big statement that he made and it was pretty scathing about yeah. the way that Facebook is run or the way that things get done in, in, in meta. Yeah. Um, he is, I heard him talk to, I think it was Joe Rogan. He did a whole three hour podcast yeah. with him and he, he basically just talks about his whole thing is efficiency, even in yeah. his, in his life. He he tries to like uh, uh, 
optimize his time as best as it could be from from the second he wakes up to the second he goes to sleep. Yeah. Um, so him working at a company where he knows what needs to be done to make it the best possible product yeah. and having people either not listen to him, take forever to get around to it, or uh, n- there's not enough time for him to say where the problems are because... Uh, uh, he can't he like he said uh uh i've never had i've never been able to kill stupid things before they cause damage yeah because it's a big company there's a lot of people working on stuff and there's like a domino effect yeah uh but i'd imagine it's like it's a big tech company it's not like the small things he's used to uh well not small but it's not like the companies he's used to having so much power in there's gonna be you know people are gonna like you know be on vacation and stuff and you won't be able to reach them. I, I think another problem with it too is um especially in recent years uh mark zuckerberg has taken such a major like control of the wheel and meta and like not just changing their name but like really steering the company towards his grand vision of what the metaverse is yeah and it's clearly having a negative effect on the whole entire company stocks are down people are losing their jobs the company is like more or less in shambles their whole you know the the latest version of the quest that they put out that was specifically for the metaverse and their horizon worlds that like is supposed to be like you know the big meeting place where all companies will have their meetings in the future is a complete fucking joke yeah and you know i don't i don't think you know zuckerberg realizes that he doesn't know what he's doing not that he doesn't know what he's doing but his idea for what the future of the company is is not really meshing with everyone else's idea for what the company should be doing i don't understand why facebook just doesn't buy vr chat (laughs) i really don't understand like i know vr chat is like weird and wacky and there's some shit going on in there but like that is what you're trying to do with the what what's it called the the metaverse app what is that called? horizon labs horizon labs horizon worlds horizon worlds that vr chat is way better than that yeah <laughs> just buy vr chat i watched they the, can't be that expensive your facebook i watched the verges review of like the latest oculus that's supposed to be for business not the quest too like there's like the next one and like the review of horizon worlds and it is embarrassing yeah it is really and like i felt embarrassed for the people who worked on this yeah because it is clearly like it's not even an alpha it is like pre pre alpha and they're releasing this because they think it's the future yeah this isn't even the past i mean i see the value like like there's something there's something to like just being in a virtual world with people that aren't yeah immediately next to you or can't be next to you for some reason there's there is value to that um and and i kind of see where zuckerberg would uh he's putting the problem is he's gonna have so much like he's running the company into the ground yeah and they have to be able to weather that for years and years and years like this thing won't be like vr is not going to be a mainstream thing yeah until you can get glasses like what you have on your face that could show you a virtual world because like you're not gonna no i'm not gonna put on a a 10 pound headset just to log into work and talk to my boss all day yeah all day to do that all day yeah Yeah. it's just not gonna happen organized thoughts is oh no is bob a joe rogan listener on that one episode with john carmack on there (laughs) yes (laughs) um anyway the long-haired fellow says might end up with a group of furries suing Facebook. <laughs> Very I really possible. do think VR chat is great. <laughs> uh, and it would be wacky and wild. I think one of the problems with VR chat is that there's like licensed characters in it and stuff. Yeah. But I think they try to get rid of them every once in a while. Um, but I mean, it, I mean, what's the difference between having a licensed character model in a game? that's user uploaded or having a profile picture that is a licensed character that's a good point 
you know because yeah. that's what the future is yeah. gonna be like the only issue would be if you could trick people into buying a game thinking that it is like a superman game but superman's not yeah. in it it's just a user uploaded superman i mean it's fucking uh ready player one yeah that's what yeah, yeah. i mean look at fortnite that is, you got Fort, yeah. fucking everybody in fortnite fortnite is literally ready player one but I guess they have uh, the license for all of those people because yeah. they're they're big enough. But Facebook's big enough. They could do it. Anyway, uh, that that's that's our uh, that's our take on Facebook, I yeah. guess. <laughs> uh, and remember, always remember to tell your parents that if they want to get off Facebook and start using Instagram instead, it's owned by Facebook. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, all right. Next, we got Diablo Four Collector's Edition. It's a hundred dollars, and there's no game in it. I, I hate that this is a thing. Uh, Blizzard unveiled the uh, release date for his long-awaited Diablo Four during the Game Awards, uh, capitalizing on the attention surrounding the release tra- date trailer and general hype. Uh, Blizzard decided to update their official gear shop with some Diablo-themed merchandise and goodies. The Diablo Four Limited Collector's Box contains ca- a candle. Mouse pad, cloth map from the in from an in-game location, a commemorative pin, an art book, and some fine art prints. The description also specifically states that it contains no physical game or no code to download it digitally. The Diablo 4 limited uh, collector's box does not include a copy of the game. This is a separate purchase. Also, players located in South Korea and Australia will have additional retail options to purchase from announced soon. This did not go over well with the community who accused Blizzard of milking his player base and being generally disrespectful toward them. Uh, Josh Strife Hayes posted a tweet uh, regarding the lack of actual game in the collector's box and reaction have been overwhelmingly negative with some even accusing Blizzard of being deceptive on purpose. Yeah. I mean, (sighs) we're used to being upset when a game company uh, just puts a digital version of the game. In a big collector's edition. Yeah. But at least they're giving you the game. Yeah. They're they're, like, this is not the first time I've heard of this either. I remember when Wolfenstein, the new order came out, they did something like this where there was a collector's edition and it didn't come with the game. Yeah. Like this is not the first time this has happened. And it's ridiculous that it continues to happen. Like, why are you like the game is going to be $70. This collector's edition is a hundred bucks. Why can't you just bundle it together and give us like a good discount of like 150 bucks? Yeah. Or even if it's $200. But people are going to buy it. Yeah. People bought the stupid $200 Gotham Knights bundle. It doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You got to put the game in it. Yeah. It's going to be a collector's edition. I mean, I mean the wording they used, they called it a collector's box, like a swag box. Right. But you're calling it the Diablo four collector's box. So that's implying that the game is included in there yeah, some no, way. Yeah, no, you are. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 this goes like, against, yeah, Diablo 4 limited collector's box. It comes, they didn't call it a limited edition. Like, okay, so it comes with a candle, a mouse pad, a cloth map, a pin, an art book, and prints. Those are not things people would buy all together unless it came with the game. Those are yeah. things people would buy individually. Yeah, it's implied that this is a collector's edition yes. of the game. So this is very stupid. Uh, I hope that this does not catch on at all. Yeah, I hope this is the end of this. I hope this is makes people make a big enough stink so that you know other companies don't get the same idea. Yeah, because this is. I mean, there are a lot of bad trends in games. Um, this is one I hope ends. It just now. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense to not include the game. Uh, I'm not getting Diablo 4 anyway. So, yeah, me uh, neither. But I know a lot of people who are. It's a very popular game. Yeah. Uh, any notifications? Yeah, we got Volus with eight months. Thank you very much. And we got the Konami man with eight months who says, there's my sub for the month. Now treat me nice for another 30 days. Happy holidays, guys. Keep up the great work on the pod. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Um, all right. Next up. Dual sense edge battery life shorter than original. Now, how shorter? Because I honestly um, am not surprised that yeah. the battery life is shorter. Um, well, let's read. Uh, f- this is on the Verge. The Verge just published uh, hands-on impressions of Sony's newest Dual Sense Edge gamepad, the two hundred dollars answer to Microsoft's Elite controller. 
Uh, and the writers come away fairly impressed. But you should know that there's one not so impressive issue, um, one not so impressive change from the original Dual Sense. It's the less battery life. Um, and Sony confirms this with The Verge. Here's the company's full statement. The DualSense Edge wireless controller's operating time is moderately shorter than the original DualSense wireless controller because we've included many more features within the same form factor and ergonomic design as the original DualSense controller. We want to strike a good balance between wireless operating time and deliver ro delivering robust high-performance features. Additionally, a longer USB braided cable is also great for competitive players who prefer playing with a wired connection to avoid wireless interference. This option preserves battery life. Uh, Sony set out in late 2018 to build a high-performance premium controller holding over 100 research sessions with pro gamers to figure out the biggest pain points, uh, says DualSense Edge product manager Tomomasa Mizuno. Uh, he says that the company eventually challenged itself to build an uncompromised gamepad in the same form factor as the excellent DualSense gamepad that shipped with the PS5. But though every generation of Sony wireless controllers has had a weak battery life, including the original DualSense, it apparently isn't one of the it isn't one of the pain points that Sony is addressing at this time. Um, in experience, the Dual Sense lasts longer than the Dual Shock Three and Four, um, but uh, the writer still had to buy a dedicated charging stand because it still runs out of battery at inconvenient times. You can use such a stand with the Dual Sense Edge Two or plug it in using the bundled two point eight meter USB C cable. So I, I like this video. He's comparing it to a regular PS5 control. He's yeah. comparing it to a scuff, which is interesting uh, because that's probably just as expensive as the DualSense Edge. Yeah. And then he compares it to the new PDP one that has like the swappable uh, D pad and stuff. The Victrix. The Victrix. Yeah. Um, I think this controller doesn't look more premium. It looks worse than an actual. I mean, it looks, controller. It, I don't like the glossy plastic uh, under the thumbsticks. Yeah. I don't like it at all. It doesn't look good. And and the black touchpad doesn't look as good. And the black buttons don't look as good as the white buttons. It's It looks worse. Yeah. But it's four times the price. <laughs> um, I didn't hear them say how much shorter the battery life is. Uh, I don't think they've confirmed... Uh, it's just that Sony said that the battery life will be shorter because there's more stuff in it. Yeah, they're admitting that it's going to be shorter. But what did they put in it? Because, like, they took things out. Well. Like, it, the haptic triggers I don't think are in it anymore. Well, I think it, I think it still does have the haptic triggers. They have the hair triggers switching now. Okay. I think the button design is, oh, it's got profile. It's got profiles in it. So you can choose between three different profiles okay. on there. Uh, I think they did change the buttons. Additionally, the longer USB braided cable is also great for competitive players who prefer playing with a wired connection to avoid wireless interference. This option preserves battery life. Yeah, it's plugged in. Yeah. Of course it's going to preserve battery. And hey, if you want to <laughs> preserve the battery life on your iPhone, charge it. Yeah. <laughs> it's so stupid. Yeah. I have, I pre-ordered one of these. I hope. I think I did. It's coming in at the end of January. Yeah. So I'll see. But I, yeah, I don't like the way it looks. I like the 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 the, the most interesting thing to me is the uh, triggers that can be set to hair triggers. Yeah. I like that on the Xbox controller. Uh, it's my least favorite thing about a PlayStation Five controller is that the travel is so harsh. And, I think, uh, and you can set it in software, but yeah. uh, it's not as. The, it should be game specific. I think know. the most interesting thing is um, the replaceable analog sticks, because the, yeah, the back buttons. No, no, the analog oh, sticks. Oh, right, no, that is interesting. Yeah, because I mean that's kind of a way to eliminate uh, drift. Yeah, but also that opens the door for like different kinds of analog sticks to be inserted in there. Yeah, I'm not sure they would go that far. Well, right. no, they have uh, different heights and stuff. Right, that's like the inside. That, yeah, that, that's but also, I mean, the whole mechanism it opens up the door for like third party modifications or like user main modifications. True, true. Uh, they did that specifically because 
they had drift issues as well. Yeah. On on uh maybe not to the extent that uh Switch did, but they did get yeah. some heat for having uh the dual sense controllers drift a little bit. So once they start to drift, you can just purchase the thumbstick. We don't know how much the thumbsticks are gonna go for. Uh there's a spot for an extra joystick module in the controller's bundled carrying case too, though it doesn't come with extras. Yeah. Uh, Sony declined to answer questions about whether it considered longer battery life or mag- magnetic Hall effect sensor joysticks. Mm-hmm. So that's the thing. Yeah. Going to your point, they could in the future start selling Hall effect uh, sticks. Thumbsticks are twenty dollars. Is did it say it? Yeah. I oh think yeah, so, it did. Yeah. It did say it. Uh, and you will be able to purchase them on January 26th. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, I'm interested. I mean, it's weird to me that a lot of, like, Call of Duty players use PlayStation 4 controllers. Interesting. Uh, that's, like, their thing. I yeah. don't know why they don't use Xbox controllers. I think they're just set in their ways from the PlayStation 3 and 4. Well, no, PlayStation well, no. 4 days. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, most people generally agree like that offset control style is better for shooters yeah the xbox yeah. control style i think xbox 360 days if you started call of duty around then you should like yeah. the xbox layout more but playstation 4 days uh call of duty you know was yeah had a deal with playstation so that's why i think and more people had playstation 4s yeah so and i think that's why these competitive players stuck with playstation 4 yeah. i don't think the playstation 4 controller is any better at all than an xbox controller i don't know why these people should be using elite controllers yeah i mean scuff probably helps yeah i still i have that xbox scuff controller i well, haven't I mean, used it I, at least for me personally i when i play a game i like to you know if i play a game on a certain system i like to continue to play that game with that kind of controller mm-hmm you know, when I go back and play Sega Genesis games, I like I prefer playing it on a Genesis controller rather than a modern controller with like the diamond. Yeah, out, yeah, out no, that makes sense. Or like even NES games, I, I want my A and B buttons to be horizontal rather than offset. Yeah. So, I mean, there is an input lag thing with PC. I think. Yeah. I think PlayStation controllers have less input lag than 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 Xbox controllers. Yeah. Something weird. Okay. Which Something is weird. weird like. like that. Xbox has that proprietary wireless. That's the thing. Yeah. It's because if you play it on PC, you don't get oh, Xbox true. proprietary wireless. Um, but wired Xbox should not have any input lag. Right. I, I'm, I'd i imagine that the input lag is so marginal that it doesn't even matter. Yeah. Um, anyway. Irv says, I think more people use Battle Beaver more than Scuff. It's just Scuff is more no- notable. Scuff is a bigger brand, and I think more of these big like Call of Duty streamers and 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 players are like sponsored by Scuff. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh let's blast through some more of these. We have yes. Ash and Pikachu Lead Pokemon. Yes, this is a big deal. Uh for many kids. So big that USA Today picked it up. Oh my god, wow. Uh, after finally becoming the very best like no one ever was, Ash Ketchum's 25-year journey in the animated Pokemon TV series will soon be coming to an end as the series will focus on a brand new character next year. The boy from Pallet Town, alongside his longtime partner Pikachu, became the world champion in an episode of Pokemon Ultimate Journeys, the series that aired in Japan in November. Uh, with the series' main character as the top Pokemon trainer, the Pokemon Company announced but the final chapter in Ash and Pikachu's story will begin on January 13th, 2023, uh, with 11 episodes culminating the journey that began in 1997. Oh. I was 10. <laughs> the forthcoming special episodes uh, not only celebrate Ash's monumental achievement, but they also act as an expression of gratitude from Pokemon to all the fans who have joined, joined him and his partner, Pokemon Pikachu, along the way. The Pokemon Company said in a statement, uh, they will provide a glimpse at what the future may hold for the world's strongest trainer in his final chapter as at, uh, for Ash and his Pikachu. So yeah, as Ash's story comes to a close, Pokemon will shift to dual protagonists named Liko and Roy in Japan in a new series set to be released at some point in 2023. Oh, they already have names for them. Yes. Interesting. I like the idea of dual protagonists. Yes. Because, I mean, every game has a rival. Yeah. You know, so having both of them uh, it would be pretty cool. It is interesting because, like, the whole like 
joke of the series is like Ash never won the big battle at the end. Yeah. And the Regency go, but like it kept the series going. That's and- what I don't like about this <laughs> is that he just won for the first time right. in his whole 25 years. Yeah. He finally won. And they're like, all right, see ya. You're done. Yeah. You're well, I mean, out. he finally retired. He finally reached the top. So where else is there for him to go? To maintain it. To reach the top again? Yeah, to maintain it. He won one tournament in one area. You I know? mean, there's nothing. He's got to be the best like no one ever was. The, go dominate the world now. There's nothing that says that Liko and Roy can't then challenge him. Yeah. No, they probably yeah. will. So, but like when that was announced that like he finally won a tournament, like the whole thing, is like where did you take the show from there? The answer is, you move on to another group of people. No, you go to the next region, like he does all the time. But and then you fight that well, region. He trainer. goes to the next region because he didn't win in the previous region. What? So what does he do? Stay in the region? What are the rules the of Pokemon? Of that region? That's what I think happens if you win. In the- you got to go between all the regions. And- well, yes, because in Gold and Silver, mm-hmm. you know, you when you beat. Kanto is the original region, right? From Red and Blue? Yes. Yeah, when you, when beat, you beat Johto, Johto you go to, you Kanto. Go to Kanto. Yeah. And the boss of Kanto is the player character from the first game. But with that logic, you would stay in Johto. You wouldn't then go to Kanto. Good point. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. He should move on to the to whatever the region is in, in, yeah. in, in the new Pokemon. But I but I do also see the value in just having new characters. Ash has played out. He's yeah. done enough. I see that. I just it I wish he had more time to be on top. You know, yeah. he's finally on top, and then yeah. it's like goodbye. I'm surprised this wasn't done sooner. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the uh, voice actress says it's been an extraordinary privilege to have been the English voice of Ash Ketchum for what will be 17 years. No matter what lies beyond his final chapter, he'll live forever in the hearts of many generations to come. I'll keep him present for all of us in every way I can. Oh, so nice. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm sure he'll be back, but also I think there's 11 more episodes with him in it. They're, they're yeah. doing like a, yeah, they just said thing. they're doing like a wrap up. Yeah. So he's not gone yet. He'll be yeah, here for a while, but he will be gone. So hope you liked Ash. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we got some Amazon news. This, uh, Amazon is going to publish the next Tomb Raider game. Amazon and Crystal Dynamics strike a deal for, Laura Croft's next adventure. The next Tomb Raider game in development at Crystal Dynamics will be published by Amazon Games. The untitled follow-up to 2018 Shadow of the Tomb Raider will be a multi-platform game that's described as a single-player, narrative-driven adventure that continues Laura Croft's story in the Tomb Raider series. As previously announced, Tomb Raider will be developed using uh, Epic Games' Unreal Engine 5. In the news release, Amazon and Crystal Dynamics called the next game in the franchise the biggest, most expansive Tomb Raider game to date. It also noted... It is also noted to be in the early development and release window and platforms have not bet yet been announced. Previous entries in the Tomb Raider franchise were published by Square Enix. The publisher acquired Eidos Interactive, which owned Crystal Dynamics in 2009. But earlier this year, Square Enix sold off Crystal Dynamics and other studios um, to Embracer Group. Now Amazon Games is stepping in to provide full support and publishing for Tomb Raider. Amazon Games is committed to bringing players... Um, games of the highest quality from the best developers across all varieties of platforms and genres and we're honored by the opportunity to work with this story developer and franchise says the vp of amazon games christopher hartman Uh, our team is incredibly excited about collaborating with this talented and visionary crystal dynamics team to bring the next chapter of Lara croft saga to players around the world i i I think this is uh i mean i like amazon games publishing games not just for fucking luna yeah (laughs) you know this is a this is i think they should get involved more with with stuff like this well amazon of all like the big tech companies who've tried to make a tried to like get a foothold in games and have not really succeeded they're the ones that like keep trying Mm -hmm. they they are like gung-ho on trying to get like their name established in the game space Mm -hmm. They've had, they haven't really had like a lot of hits. They've had mostly misses. Like the article says, 
Uh, Amazon has struggled uh, to find a foothold in games with its original properties, trying and bailing with games like Breakaway, uh, Crucible, and a Scraps Lord of the Rings MMO. The games division of Amazon has found better luck with New World and by publishing Smilegate's Lost Ark. Uh, last week, Amazon Games announced it was teaming up with Bandai Namco to bring a Blue Protocol to a global audience. So, they're definitely... They're, someone at Amazon's like, we need to be a game company ASAP. Like, yeah. We could do it. And they have been having a lot of problems with it. I think this is like the like their next step. Not doing it themselves, but like funding games. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, Tomb Raider was up in the air because yeah. of the Square Enix. Uh, yeah, was because Square Enix was getting rid of all of their Western stuff. Yeah, so Amazon felt like they could do something with it and yeah. and and that was i i think a good uh uh strategy for them yeah they, they, to, to swoop up a franchise as big an american franchise yeah as Tomb Raider. yeah i think this is definitely like gonna be a a good move yeah for them it is interesting though because like embracer group is a publisher themselves mm -hmm. like they i think pretty sure they own deep silver who was a, was a very prominent publisher why aren't they doing it now does this mean i will get it for free with Amazon Prime. Maybe. Also, God of War live action series is coming Okay. Out. Uh, While you read this, I'm going to get unboxing stuff. Okay. Speaking of Amazon and gaming, a live action adaptation of PlayStation's uh, God of War has been ordered to series at Amazon Prime Video with Wheel of Time boss Rafe Judkins uh, set as showrunner. Based on the massively popular 2018 video game, that's important, the show follows Kratos, the god of war, who, after exiling himself from his blood-soaked past in ancient Greece, hangs up his weapons forever in the Norse realm of Midgar, per Amazon's description. When his beloved wife dies, Kratos sets off on a journey uh, with his estranged son, Atreus, to spread her ashes from the highest peak, uh, his wife's final wish. Kratos soon realizes that the journey is an epic quest in disguise, uh, one which will test the bonds between father and son and force Kratos to battle new gods and monsters for the fate of the world. Judkins will show run an executive produced a series based on the game developed by Sony Santa Monica uh, with Iron Man and Children of Men writers uh, Mark Fergus and Hawk o Ostby also writing and executive producing. Santa Monica Studios creative director Corey Balrog will also serve as executive producer in addition to PlayStation Productions Azad uh, Quizzlebash. And Carter Swan, I nailed it. Are these Harry Potter names? Yeah. Santa Monica Studios, uh, Yumi Yang and Vertigo's Roy Lee. Uh, Santa Monica Studios, Jeff Ketchum, uh, no relation to Ash, is co-executive producing. The show is co-produced by Amazon Studios and Sony Pictures Television. Um, so yeah, they're they're going to make the 2018 God of War a TV show. Okay. It's the long and short of it. Here's my thing. Mm -hmm. the, the whole reason... Why everybody loves the 2018 God of War story is because of God of War 1, 2, and 3. Okay. Because Kratos starts off that game, and it starts off God of War 2018 as like a, as a shell of his former self. And his journey of self-discovery to try and become a better man. That doesn't work unless you know what a horrible monster he was yeah. in the first three games. <laughs> you know? This is like how... You know, to use an example, The Dark Knight Returns works as a comic because it's building on the, at that point, like 40 years of Batman comics that had preceded it. You can't really just jump in and make, uh, an, adapt that as a movie itself mm -hmm. because it's, you're not going to have all the history that the source material was referencing. You're not going to have that to call upon, you know, for people who, you know, yeah, maybe they didn't follow God of War from the beginning, but they were aware of it. And they knew that, you know, previously Kratos was, you know, a horrible mass murderer. The, the audience for the TV show is potentially going to be a different audience than those who played the games. Yeah, obviously people who play the game is gonna, are going to watch it. But, you know, my in-laws might watch it. You know, people like that. So, and they, they don't know God of War. That There's a lot of legwork now that you have to do in order to make this show make any sort of sense. And by not having that history, you're removing, you know, a very big emotional connection to the main character of the game. I think 
it's interesting that they would want to do this without first seeing how well uh, The Last of Us did. Particularly because the stories are very similar. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, gruff, hairy dad game. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> and, and they're both a video game, you know. Yeah. Well, I feel... Well, Sony seems to be very much taking a... Um, who, who wants it? Who wants our franchise to make the TV show? Mm -hmm. So I don't think... I don't think they're really caring about waiting to see like which is successful and what's not. I think they just assume it's going to be successful because The Last of Us, it's an HBO series. It's being made by the guy who did Chernobyl, which was very successful. Right. That, that guy recently came out and said that like The Last of Us is the greatest video game story of all time. He's clearly never played a Final Fantasy game. <laughs> <laughs> I saw him getting memed on for saying that The Last of Us is the greatest uh, video yeah. game story ever told. Uh, I think it's certainly up there. It's a very good story. Yeah. But, I mean, to single it out, like, you have to have some, like, very, very convincing arguments against it. Because you're missing it. You're, like, you're excluding a lot of other really great, well-told stories like Half-Life 2, like Metal Gear Solid, you know, like Bioshock, you know, games mm -hmm. like that. G even, game like, point-and-click adventures like the Monkey Island games and Grim Fandango. I think that there's very few games that uh, do things narratively that could only be done in video games, like make you do things that uh, make the storytelling better yeah. because you're the one who's doing it. And I think The Last of Us is one of the best examples of yeah. that. And the problem is you lose all of that when you translate it yeah. to, to the screen. So uh, that it, it might, it is one of the best stories ever told, period. And I think more people even people who don't play games should be able to experience it, but you're going to lose some of that magic. Yeah. You have to try to give something else in place of that magic that you're losing. For the record, I do think games like Metal Gear do a very similar thing. There's yeah. things that only a video game would be able to do to, to make you yeah. feel a certain way about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think Metal Gear Solid Five did something very similar to what The Last of Us did with making you do something you don't want to do. Yeah. It's just the last of uh, Metal Gear Solid 5 got cucked by Konami. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it has one of the best moments in video games. Uh, and just after it, the rest of it just isn't that great. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, last thing is Spider-Man 2 release date confirmed. Yes. Now I know when I'm going to be buying my PlayStation 5. Um, here you go. I'll just I'll just skip to it. Uh, Spider Man Two will be coming in fall of twenty twenty three. Yay! Yay! And you still got the Spider Man. Yes, it's, now, now it's both of them. It's it's Peter and Miles. I didn't play enough of these games. Okay. Why is Miles and with Peter? Why is Peter Parker and Miles in the same universe? Okay, so in this universe, which I actually think they did a really good job of it, Miles is just a person. Okay. He's just there. And there's um there's like ex I think it was an Oscorp thing where like they were doing experiments on spiders to try and recreate Spider-Man. And one of those spiders got loose and found its way to Miles and bit him. So he also develops spider power. So there is just two Spider-Man in yes. this universe. Okay. And in Miles Morales, you know, the DLC for Spider-Man like there's a subplot where Peter is training Miles like how to use his powers. And then Miles Morales is all about Peter saying MJ and I are going to Europe for a few weeks. Can you be the city Spider-Man? And Miles is like, oh, okay. And he like it's all about him learning how to be Spider-Man. Okay. So and then this, I guess this game is about the two of them just both being Spider-Man. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm down with that. Because in the comics, they're they're both exist in the same universe now, and they're both Spider-Man. I oh, think how do they get in the same universe? Don't worry about it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a think this is a very good job of introducing Peter and Miles in the same universe without some dumb comic book interdimensional nonsense. Right. I right, mean, right. I love me some dumb comic book interdimensional nonsense, but I also prefer much simpler explanations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm noticing people in the chat are getting a little trigger happy. They're getting a little too trigger happy. Giving off the whole, giving off the whole, where's the fucking thing? Where is it? Oh. 
Where is it? <laughs> Thought I was being sly here. Nope. Quit of the week. There Quit it is. Of the week. Quit of the week. I was hitting the wrong button. Hey. Oh, yeah, it's tweet of the week time. Okay. All right. This is uh from Brandon Strunzen. I don't know. It says this is my sideways. I don't know what that means, but here here it is. Well, hold on. This is for you. I got distracted. Oh wait, I can't play. How do I play this so that people can hear it? Oh, I know. I'll just mic my laptop. <laughs> It'll be a little delayed, but it's fine. Oh. Watch this, watch this, man. What's that mean? Oh, look at the legs, look at the legs, the way it runs down the glass. Something happened about how the way it's supposed to affect the taste buds. I'm like, who gives a flying F about the legs? I just want to know what it tastes like when I taste it. Okay, we've got to do the smell test to it. You always got to... <laughs> Smells good. Got a good aroma to it. Yeah. Got a nice bouquet. Mm. <laughs> that is indeed a tasty beverage. <laughs> it's just a TikTok of Stone Cold and The Undertaker trying wine. That's beautiful. Uh, Sideways was a movie starring Paul Giamatti and uh, Thomas Hayden Church where they go to different wineries and taste wine. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, All right. I, I, I like this better. All right. No, I do too. I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, it was a BuzzFeed video where Stone Cold Steve Austin tries a bunch of mixed drinks. No. I, and he, he hates them all. I can't imagine. He hates them all. He just likes beer. <laughs> yes. And like not even good beer. I will I will say though, his like Stone Cold Broken Skull beer that he like actually makes is very good. Oh, that's I good. I enjoy it. Even his IPA and I don't like IPAs. Now, I can't imagine him going to like test stuff out you know no. like going to the to the brewery and then <laughs> here's all the different i don't care like, i don't care probably just be like getting mad like what what is this a piece of trash and <laughs> smash them over the head with it uh uh all right is stone cold steve austin the greatest wrestler of all time yes <laughs> now we're gonna talk to you people yes we're gonna start by answering questions left on last week's wolf podcast over on the youtube channel youtube.com slash wolf podcast uh, why don't you look at that while I unbox stuff? Yes. We got a lot of stuff here. Uh, Alejandro Tamez said, I exclusively play Kirby the Forgotten Land co-op with my toddler. It's a family game at my house. I guess I should start doing that playing games with my toddler. I like I should take advantage of the Xboxes. I, they call it big brother mode. Co-pilot mode. That's it. Where you give that the controller, but you really control what's happening. Okay. That's yeah, I, I, I got an Xbox controller for you. Oh, good. <laughs> This is by Game Sir. Remember them? They do like the. I'm pretty sure they do like the controllers for like iPhones and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess they make an Xbox controller. There you go. Uh, backseater mode says King Wizard. Yeah, that's what it's called. Is that uh, actually what's called? I thought it was Copilot. I think you might be right. I think he's. Just I've I've heard a, like I've heard it referred control. to like Big Brother mode, backseater, Copilot mode. You know, but it'll be good because like. She can play, like she can interact with it, and if she needs help, that's what I step in. Right. I did see an Instagram reel of like a father watching their kid play video games for the first time, and like he's trying real hard not to like tell them what to do. I saw that exact one. It was it was Super Mario World. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's gonna be me. Yeah, that per that that kid sucked at that game. By the way, <laughs> that kid did not know dick about Mario yeah. World. Uh, we're fucking yelled at that kid too. Keyholes. My most played was Ooblets. Uh, got so into the game this autumn. It was such a cozy gem. I would love to see Steam do an unwrap style thing. I would, but too. at the same time, I'm not sure I want to confront just how many hours I've put into Stardew Valley. Oh, yeah. Why can't I get the fucking thing out of here? You might have to destroy it. I got it. There you go. Here it is. It's Ooh. wired. Okay. But I like how it's a Ooh. detachable cable. Clicky. Those are mouse clicks. Oh. Oh. That's interesting. Oh, I like it. Oh, I like that a lot. Yeah. What is with the D-pad? They got weird icons on the D-pad. Oh, the D-pad is clicky. Nice. Oh, that feels really good. They couldn't yeah. freaking put the clicks on the triggers, too? <laughs> I like I like this. Here. Look at the D-pad. Let me see it's that. Wacky. Let me see this. Uh, that is nice. I was not expecting. That. Oh, I know what that is. Um, there's for yeah for the volume. Uh, uh, left is game volume and right is uh headset volume. This like, controller uh, has people a volume headset headphone jack in the uh, yes. bottom. Well, they all have Xbox controllers now. 
have it. But I'm guessing this M button is for controlling the volume mm. of it. Because this yeah. next package is from Retro Fighters. They gave me three what looks like controllers. So okay. this is going to be wacky and wild. Okay. All right. I mean, I don't hate this controller. It's light. Can you recommend a hall sensing Joy-Con alternative? No, they they specifically one that can be played docked. Oh, not Joy-Con alternative, uh, but like but a Pro Controller. Pro Controller, the Gully Kit's really the. Yeah. Oh no no no! I'm sorry. You got the Gully Kit and you got the uh, Ape Do Ultimate, and I like the Ultimate. Uh, V4 uh, from last week says that Bayonetta prequel was actually already teased in a secret level in Bayonetta Three, where you play a segment of the new game. Oh. I did not know that. We didn't play Bayonetta 3. No, I gotta see that. And also, never been brought up in all like the previews for the new Bayonetta game. It's because nobody fucking played Bayonetta 3, Well, But it was... I thought it sold well. <laughs> People just like the idea of Bayonetta. Yeah. Uh, speaking of just liking the idea... How uh, get in here? Soba from last week says, To me, Crash Team Rumble looks like Knockout City, but you collect points like in Pokemon Unite. Ooh. This is a... So it's Retro Fighter makes the Brawler 64, yes. which is the N64 controller uh, that's modernized. Yes. Which is basically the only way I play N64 games yeah. now. Uh, they made wireless ones for the Switch, finally. Oh. Uh, and they work with Nintendo Switch Online, which okay. has the weird control yeah, scheme. Yeah. This is an all-white one, Ooh, which is interesting. That is interesting. Yeah. Yeah, you can look Very at it. Very cool. There's other colors I have here. Yeah, let me see. They never sent over the, the PlayStation controllers. I guess not. I guess I'm just going to buy one. Uh, Crest Team Rumble looks like Knockout City, but you collect points like in Pokemon Unite. Yeah, yeah, that's confusing. Yeah. I feel like they could have done a better job of like explaining what that game is and why you should care. Because honestly, it looks like a mobile game that they're porting up to console. It probably is also going to be a mobile game. Yeah. We got a uh, transparent like teal, I guess. Like green, but teal-ish, okay. like bluish, kind of cool. And then the last one I think is just straight up gray. Oh, oh it's got power. Oh, there's a smudge on the B button. <gasps> Let me see. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. There's, there's a scuff on the B button already. Oh, I like the blue. The blue looks nice. Yeah. It's like Wii colors almost. Oh my god! There's a yeah. scuff on the B button. Wow. Look at that shoddy work. It has some really harsh uh, gates on yeah. the thumbstick, but I mean that's how the controller was yeah so this is gray just like the regular uh, yeah n64 controller this definitely got wii vibes this color let me see that uh i want to i yeah. it uh retro fighter has a little bit of like a harsh plastic feel this you kind of feel that yeah no they did the thought they, they did the triggers way better yeah the first the, the one that i have the original one was a kickstarter situation yeah and the triggers were bad uh, but it was like fine because it was the only game in town. Now yeah. they've they've they made it. It feels like a pro controller now. Yeah, this is nice. I like this, and the buttons are nice and clicky, but not as clicky as that motherfucker right here. Uh, it's clicky as shit. Last one from last week. Uh, David Peterson is Mario Kart Eight the most per uh, pervasive Switch game, as in the most common game played among system and or market demos. Breath of the Wild and Smash Brothers, while top selling and or most minutes played. Probably only covers a certain demo or two, uh, so much, uh, so much it hardly uh, needs broader appeal like Mario Kart Eight has. Um, I believe Mario Kart Eight is the best-selling game on Switch. Yeah, and probably most played because of that. Yeah, uh, Mario Kart Eight, like yeah, literally everybody I know has Mario Kart Eight. That's that number pad. So what I have here is the glorious uh, number pad. That's also like a macro pad. I was yes. gonna include this in my gift guide video, but I didn't get it in time. Uh, I'm going to use this on this podcast probably to switch between uh, scenes if I can get it to work. Okay, that's my that's my idea. Hopefully, does it have the same? They gave me linear switches. No good. Those motherfuckers. But can't you can, you can change that right? Any linear switches, and this isn't blue. But I don't think they make them blue. I think they only make them clear like this or or silver like this. Oh, there's Bluetooth. Oh, even better. That's cool. Okay, I like that. That's actually... Like, I wouldn't use Bluetooth normally, but for this I will. Because yeah. I don't have to plug it in anywhere. That'd be awesome. I can just, see that. just put it right here and go beep, boop, bop. I kind of wish... This has got weight to it. I know. I kind of wish the buttons uh, were just blank. 
I could put blank buttons on it, but yeah, but even still, I wish that they were just that they just came blank. Can you swap out the switches on this? Yeah, or? yeah, they're, they're hot. they. I mean, I I don't know for sure, but uh, I bet a lot of money on it. And then I guess this is the cable. Yeah, this is the cable. Very very cool. Very, very cool. I'm happy about that. Thank you, glorious. And then the last thing I have here is a Retroid Pocket Three Plus, but I'm not gonna unbox that because I'm gonna do a whole video on it. So we'll have to wait for that. All right. It has a slider. Beep boop beep boop beep beep boop beep. All right. Now we'll be in the chat. Hello, okay. guys. Uh, MC Sir Tuna, thanks for the two months, and Toha, thank you for the gifted sub. All right, talk to us. I'm just gonna press buttons on my little number pad. <laughs> uh, oh, do you want to do the giveaway now, or? Oh yeah. What time is it? Oh, it's uh, oh we're so far over the giveaway yeah. time. All right, if you've typed in an exclamation point giveaway, you're already entered. You don't have to do anything. Uh, here we go. Here we go. It's going to be loud. Sorry, guys. Check it out. Here it is. Wow. And we're doing it right now. We're giving away a $50. Uh, what do you call it? Something around Gift card. Something or other. You better be here, or I swear to God. Uh, Ooh, double, double stuff. stuff. Hey, we got those. Thanks to you, Will. You're welcome. Uh, all right, you better be here in the chat. If yeah. you are, you got to say something right now. Hey, hey, all right. All right. Congratulations. Uh, congratulations. Uh, where are you? Double stuff. There you are. Uh, I'm going to whisper you after the show. So get ready for that. Uh, anyway. Wood is still trying to win the, con the contest. Wood, you have <laughs> failed. Uh, I, the, the rule is if you do exclamation point giveaway more than once, you're banned. So well, I'm going to have to ban Wood. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, now the chat's overrun with people doing exclamation point giveaway. Yeah. Uh, Double Stuff does ask, uh, any recommendation on controllers for the N64? I was just about to buy one on Amazon. Uh, yeah, the Retro Fighter one. Yeah, honestly, I like just the wired one. I don't like messing around with wireless stuff. I did use the wireless ones on a bachelor party, and they worked very well in conjunction with original N64 controllers. So, uh, oh, so the wireless ones that were specifically for N64? Yes. Yeah, because these are brand new, the, the yeah. wireless 64 ones. Uh, whisper hello. All right, I'll, I'll DM you after the show. I just wrote hello to reserve your spot. Uh, my feelings are hurt on behalf of Ash. He beat the champions. He is the very best. No more regions to visit. You got to keep maintain the championship. Is what I'm saying. Well, he probably has to defend that championship in that region. Wood says, I have a question for Will. Will Bob play Valorant tonight? Uh, no. That was a it was a play on the word. Will. I know, I know what it is, and no, Bob. I might, I Valorant. might play. I might actually play Valorant. Tonight. Um, I haven't tried it yet, but apparently the PlayStation Retro Five controller works well with the Switch. That's weird. That's Are they strange. both Bluetooth? Because the, the uh, PlayStation One has a dongle. I, I, don't know. I don't know. Does this have a switch on it, or is this just straight up Bluetooth? Yeah, just straight up Bluetooth. Okay. Oh, it has the uh, home and share buttons on the top. Oh. Just like but, the N64 But I also saw a Switch. home and share button on the... No, wait. Home minus start share. And then what the fuck is that? Let me see. Oh, that must be sync. Uh, I guess. That's weird. Home, yeah. and sh home and minus are on the front. That's yeah. weird. I will say with the alt with the Ape do ultimate control, I kept hitting uh the wrong button for start or something. Yeah. Something was not oh no, home. The home button was not right. I kept hitting uh uh the share button by accident. Mm -hmm. Pimax portal is looking pretty good right now with that with what they say they're offering. That's that we I'm so sick of these like Steam Deck like alternatives. Oh no. There's too many of them and they're all too expensive. 
if you hit a price point that's like the Steam Deck, then I'll be interested. Oh, what the hell? It's also oh. ugly as all hell. It's a hybrid VR something or other. It's on Kickstarter. What is it interesting about this? Yeah, it just looks like a Steam Deck light. Yeah, like the the it looks like it has Joy Cons that can come off. Yeah. But why do we care if it's VR compatible? Oh, it goes in this little like thing here. Oh, I have okay. the wrong. I have. I'm, I'm not showing my screen right now. Sorry. I guess you take the little Joy Cons off, and you can put it in like a like a little headset to play in VR. Okay. Cool. How much? How much are we talking? Well, let's go to the Kickstarter. Uh, twenty four days to go. Three hundred dollars. Okay. Does it come with the Joy Con? Uh, handheld, uh, handheld. One oh, it comes with the USB C cable. I think t- I three hundred dollars sounds pretty good. Honestly, well, that's for the early bird version. It's four hundred dollars if you miss that. Okay, that's still that's still a very good deal. Yeah, that's that sounds pretty good. Yeah. Now, now I need to know like the the type of games it could play. Well, I guess Taki Udon has a video on it, so we'll have to watch. Well, that according one. to this video, uh, this one it looks like it can play Sonic Colors because that's what they use. In the wow, fucking, well, that's thumbnail. a Wii game, so that's yeah. that's pretty powerful. It runs Android, apparently. Well, they all run Android. Uh, no, that's good because it'll be easy to put emulators on. Yeah. All right, I might be coming around to this. I think it. I think the whole Joy-Con situation is pretty stupid. <laughs> um. All right. Uh, anybody else got any questions? I think we're good here. Yeah. We're done. We 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 went a little long, guys. Thanks for hanging out. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for chatting with us. As always, the Wolfden Podcast is every single Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on twitch.tv slash Wolfden. If you can't make the show for any reason at all, we'll always put it up as an archive version over on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Wolfden Podcast. So you can go check us out over there on demand whenever you want. If you prefer to listen to us with your ears rather than watch us with your eyes, you can do that as well. <laughs> We're also an audio podcast on anchor.fm slash Wolfden Podcast or your preferred podcast service of choice. But no matter where you get the show from, folks, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us because that helps us with placement on all those respective platforms. Congratulations, Double Stuffed. I will be DMing you in a minute here on your Twitch whispers. Uh, if you'd like to win something, I uh, and you're listening to this after the fact, I guess next week's the last giveaway of the month. Yeah. Um. So be here on Twitch, or I'll I'll be streaming. Also, you don't have to just come to a podcast. Uh. Also, Chris BX. I've been having a back and forth with him. Yeah. Uh. Getting the world record on this one Mario Maker course. Okay. And he currently holds it right now. So oh. I gotta. I gotta go. I gotta go. Fuck up his life. <laughs> Um, who is on right now though nobody streams anymore what's that about I don't know man I don't know here go watch uh... yeah go watch Squeaks I like Squeaks he's playing Mario Kart he's usually a, a, a freaking uh, uh, what do you call it what's that game a Mario 64 speedrunner okay. go watch him I'll see you all uh, probably Thursday, maybe. Bye. Bye.